Welcome, everybody. Thanks for attending the uh, Commission's 69th uh, spring meeting, and, and welcome to the Big Easy. Uh, we've been doing these general sessions for, for a number of years, and, and the purpose is to, is to provide a forum to, to discuss a variety of different issues. Uh, over, over the years, we've talked, talked about uh, anything from economics to mercury to ROVs, uh, oil spills, uh, HABs, and oysters and recreational fishing. Uh, in our last meeting, we actually talked about sea turtles. So. Uh, this this uh, this year or this session, where we're going to be talking about oyster aquaculture. Uh, back in 2016, uh, we began a cooperative effort with NOAA Fisheries. Uh, this is our second year of of uh, uh, a grants program uh, to address opportunities and challenge and challenges in in oyster farming in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we uh, the previous year, I think we funded six projects. This year, we funded. <clears throat> this past year, we funded seven, <clears throat> excuse me, for almost uh, $400,000. So the presentations uh, will be uh, from those seven projects and, and presenting results and, and overviews. And again, thanks for attending and, and, uh, and enjoy the proceedings. I'll turn it over to Steve. Thank you. So the way this is going to work today is we're going to go through each presentation. Uh, depending on how much time is left at the end of each, we may have a couple of questions and answer. But there will be a panel discussion at the very end. If there's something that you want to find out more about, you make a note and, uh, and take the time at that point to go ahead and, uh, and ask any additional questions. It can be specific to the project. It can be more broad about aquaculture in general. Um, as Dave said, this is our, our second round of projects. These were the award recipients for the 2018. We just completed the RFP. It closed last Friday for 2019. Uh, the commission received nine proposals. Uh, it will be a consortium approach uh, for the coming year where a broader group will partner and, and cover a little bit bigger project. Uh, that's going to be a little different, and it could be multi-year. So uh, hopefully next year, we're going to have a whole new batch of projects uh, to be able to see. And uh, we're just real excited that we can do this. Uh, there are programs in the back. They've got a, a short abstract for each presenter. Um, there's also a sign-in sheet. So if you didn't get to sign in, we'd, uh, we'd like to at least make sure that we account of everybody. Um, and without any further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. And, uh, Albert Wynn is going to be our first presenter from McCullough Environmental Institute, and, uh, and we'll go ahead and get moving. That's them on the screen, by the way. So good morning. Uh, I hope everyone is not as asleep as uh, I am right now. but. Um, in any case, um, I'm Albert Wynn. I'm a uh, associate director at Wakulla Environment Institute. Bob Ballard is the executive director, Tallahassee Community College, Wakulla Environment Institute in Wakulla County. Um, I have with me today Mario Marquez, who is the PhD student from FAMU School of the Environment, actually did the research for us, and Dr. Charles Jago, who is the distinguished professor at FAMU School of the Environment. And what we wanted to look at was um, <clears throat> in our oyster aquaculture program, uh, different methods that affect the farmer uh, to have more positive impact, what are some of the negative impacts, how we can help with them in the industry develop the crop, so what are the inhibiting factors. Um, so one of the things we look at are different oyster growing methods, and in that, uh, some of the equipment that's used, and also oyster spat retention because of the environmental effect that it has there. What we encourage in our program is that they use 20% of their crop be diploids um, versus all triploids, and that is for the receding effect um, of oysters for the estuaries. Okay, you can move on to the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, I gotta use it myself. See, I told you I was asleep. Uh, <laughs> and on our, here is the uh, location of our site. I'm gonna see if I can use this laser pointer now. Um, this is the five acre site that we have, research site there, and Oyster Bay right behind <clears throat> Piney Island. Um, 
and we'll go a little bit further into that and what effects the hurricane had on us as we move forward. So again, our objective was to look at different oyster grow methods. And because leases are in different uh, locations, uh, there are different ways to grow your oysters. So we wanted to look at uh, deep water leases for this particular instance. So we looked at the oyster grow deep grow system and also the hybrid, super hybrid uh, system. Uh, and in our comparison, what we wanted to look at was length versus biomass and then the comparative analysis between the both of those. All right, and so in looking at over a 270 day period, and what we noticed that there wasn't a significant difference between the SEPA and the oyster grow. Um, and you can see that through the data. Mari Marquez is back there. He uh, did the data analysis for us. But when it came to the biomass, we noticed that there was a significant difference between the SEPA cages and the oyster grow cages. And then the comparison of the length versus uh, tissue, there was no real uh, significant difference between them. Um, but in practicality, um, we came across a natural catastrophe hurricane. Michael, I'm pretty sure people knew about it. Fast moving hurricane. Uh, category two is what we experienced on our lease. Um, we had about 24 hybrid cases. I know it says 12 there. And we lost uh, 21 out of the 24. So we only retained uh, three of those. We have since found some of those cages in an area and we'll get with the FWC in re, uh, retaining those. Um, but not only that, uh, in, in that experiment, what we found out is that usually they tell you to um, flood your pontoons and drop them, right? And most of the farmers, because of the fast moving hurricane, didn't have time enough to uh, drop them pontoons down. And so they experienced a lot of death, maybe about 40%, which is what we expected. Uh, but we were able to leave ours up without flooding and dropping them and they survived the category two. Um, so that is significant for us. You know, that was an unintended experiment, but nevertheless, it's something that we learned from. And we try to pass that information on back to the farmer. Um, the lower mortality rate in oyster grow cages is what we experienced, particularly because of the way the SEPA cages cover a surface area, the color actually cooks the oysters in high temperature, believe it or not. Um, when we had a high temperature day out there, on the, on the lease. Um, and we think that is basically due to the design. So not only the color retains uh, so much heat, but because of the surface area and its proximity uh, close to the cages or the baskets, we feel is a flaw that they uh, maybe should look at. Uh, and then the ability to, to sink them in, a, in the event of a hurricane is what we would hope that uh, they would also change in the design had a talk with SEPA about it, and, and that was their intention. When you look at the design, they had a place where uh, they could actually unscrew a cap, uh, but they never included in the design that they gave us. And they've since made some changes, and we are looking forward to uh, looking further into that. I got it. All right, so the other objective is, uh, the other thing that we wanted to look at was the effect that uh, oyster spat retention um, so having diploids out on your lease, how would that uh, affect the natural oyster population? And so what we wanted to look at is the retention on these oyster domes. Bob Ballard was uh, Deputy Secretary of DEP at one time and used it to do coral, believe it or not. And so we knew uh, that the SEMA domes, um, because of their structure, their rigidity, um, would be maybe a better uh, substrate to, for them to attach onto. And um, at first, this was our model for doing the investigation. We want to look at inner title versus subtitle, and then the difference in grade between one feet and three feet. And on our original model, we had seed on the outside. All right. And what we come to find out is just by going out the very next day after putting seed on the outside that they were gone. Yeah. Uh, so we had to change, due to predation, uh, predation we had to change our model and we just really just stuck the domes out there. And we just looked at the difference between a title versus subtitle. And um, what we come to find out after having a full fall spawn that oysters were everywhere underneath the domes. We were looking at on top of the domes, but underneath the domes is what we did not expect. And we come to find out that they were indeed covering a large surface area under the domes. 
So that spawn actually came through the holes that we had in the domes, and it created sort of a, an effect where it would increase the fertility rate. Um, being out there for two, uh, we had eight domes that were there for both spawns, both the spring and fall spawn. And they had oysters on the outside as well as the inside. And we thought that was significant. And I'll tell you the reason why, coming up in a few slides, why that's so significant for us. Here's a picture of when we first deployed the domes um, and the coverage at the very beginning of it. And we'll get into what we saw uh, later on. And in fact, I was out there last week and we took some pictures of that. So why is this important in our effort to um, help the Osaka aquaculture industry in the state of Florida? Basically, what we plan on doing and what we have been uh, doing in a non-formal sense is a creation of an advisory council with all the different stakeholders, scientific experts, past students, uh, legislators, to help uh, grow the oyster aquaculture industry. And not only just oyster aquaculture, we're looking at other shellfish too as well, clams, scallops is what we hope to do within the next year or so to introduce that too as well. Um, but we wanted to identify some of the challenges mitigating factors that affect an everyday crop, a farmer. One of the things that they came back to was when we're looking at all different aspects, environmental, economic, and also the legis legislative challenges, um, one of the things that uh, kept popping up is the closing of the bay. Last year, everyone knows that we had red tide last year and that created a huge economic impact. When you look at uh, our program and what we've been able to do in Wakulla County um, within the past five years, the county commission did an investigation of it, and they said if everyone that came through our program was all under one entity, one corporate entity, we would be the third largest employer in Wakulla County. That is hugely significant, and it shows the economic impact that our program has had and oyster aquaculture has had in that region. Um, after two years, what we saw is that uh, six to eight million oysters were out in the bay, and it went from being a barren desert to teeming with life within two years and clean water. Uh, so where you can actually start to see to the bottom uh, of the bay when you're out there. So clean water is one of the key things. We wanted to make sure that what if we could deploy that clean water? Uh, if we can find a way to export it. So we came up with a way, we call it Restore Tech, to deploy clean water. And it has an, a huge environmental impact. I'm pretty sure everyone in this room knows um, what the oyster reef population is today. It's about 1% of where it used to be. Um, and then Florida has a huge coastline, second in all 50 states, so that affects our tourism dollars. Um, in Sarasota County alone, $44 million was the economic impact last year due to red tide. That's a huge impact. Not, on, not only does it impact the farmer, but everyone else. You're talking about health related incidents, lost wages, tourism dollars, businesses are all affected by it. Um, and so we wanted to answer some of the questions that would result from being able to deploy clean water. Uh, one would be having a deployable seed source maybe one of the answers to Apalachicola Bay, and we're looking possibly to work with Florida State in doing that. Um, we believe we have a deployable seed source to be able to help them do, effectively do that. Uh, how to do that has been the question. How do you deploy that? I've seen people throw clams in the water and expect that would reseed it. We don't think that's the case, and they also throw oyster seed. But due to the fact that you're throwing it on the ground, it doesn't have anything, gets muddled in the mud and suffocates. It's, it's not what we call a working model. Um, but what we, we truly believe will happen is that we have found a way to effectively combat red tide. Um, and we know that oysters are filter feeder. When you look at the zebra mussel and its effect that it had on Lake Michigan, oysters would have the same effect. Nature has a way of keeping things in balance. And if you don't keep them in balance, then that's what happens when they get out of balance. You get the and other HABs um, coming across it like we had the, the, lace, the latest bloom in Florida, which uh, affected a large portion of our coastline. So here are what we have recently shown out on our lease. These, this is inside the dome, all the way to the top. This is on the outside now, from what we first started with. This is the 
restored tech domes that we've looked at and uh, that we've created. And what we looked at was not only hole size, but the shape of the hole and allowing uh, the seed to be able to, um, the sperm to be able to fer be fertilized within that dome. We believe that it would increase the rate by five, by five times is what we believe. Um, but to have live oysters uh, deployed within the dome, and you, if you have enough of it, um, you can create a spawn for an entire area and deploy that clean water. So in, early in my slide, I showed a picture. Some of those areas were in uninhabitable zones. We were looking maybe to deploy it in those areas to see how quickly it would clean the water up in those zones. And then that will open up the oyster aquaculture lease area for, our, for Oyster Bay. And hopefully we can take that around the coast of Florida. All right, so our acknowledgments, we'd like to thank GSMFC for the funding. We really do appreciate that. Um, the students and staff at WI, all the ones who've gone through our oyster aquaculture program. Next year, we're hoping to incorporate scallops and then eventually clams and do the entire water column. And that's where we're going with our future of the program. Uh, I'd like to thank, you, thank uh, the FAMU graduates and undergrad students that have come out also on the lease to help us, and Dr. Charles Jago from FAMU. Any questions? Yes. Just by pure observation, we noticed that we can see down to the bottom of the bay where before we could not see that. Uh, we are looking to do clean water research with FAMU, and we have the experts uh, there would actually look at uh, the, the quality of water, and they'll look at the nutrient population there to see what kind of harmful effects. We have some uh, information from that. Uh, I won't disclose it because it needs to be peer reviewed, um, but we looked at I can probably say we looked at nitrogen and uh, how much nitrogen was in the system at that particular time, how much was taken out of, the, out of that system due to the oyster population. Any other questions? Is it, is it on? Oh, it's on. Uh, the, I had to step out during your talk, so if you, if you answered this, forgive me, but you yes. mentioned that a certain percentage of the spat that you, or the seed that you're asking people to put out has to be diploid. Can, yes. you, can you go back over the reason for that? And, and the follow-up, I think I know what you're going to say is I'm guessing you all are considering your system to be spat limited, and so you need a certain number of additional spat in the water you feel, or, well, or, or larvae? Yeah, so in our efforts, we, we are uh, looking to have a positive uh, impact on the environment. So we all know triploids don't produce any spat. So we ask that our farmers, 20% um, of their crop, we ask that they, they use diploids for the reseeding of an area. And so for the continuous growing of the different oyster estuaries that have been depleted so much um, due to over-harvesting, overfishing. So hopefully we can, with that, with that effort, uh, have a positive impact on the environment with that. We're broadcasting this uh, session on YouTube, so we'll make sure we get all the questions. Sorry, yes. Chad. <laughs> Scott Jackson with Florida Sea Grant. Yes. Uh, I just uh, enjoyed the presentation. Now, I, I wanted to know, are you seeing any uh, seagrasses now, or if so, if, are you seeing increases or anything related to that? Yeah, and we are seeing a difference seagrasses and we're seeing uh, like I said it's teeming with life in fact people would tell us and I've seen it firsthand people are actually fishing on our lease um, I'm okay with that you know I'm trying to catch some stuff myself but uh, yeah we are seeing a difference we are seeing seagrasses grow that's what happens naturally when you um, reintroduce a keystone species we all know that oysters are a keystone species when you take that out of the environment 
is when it will have a huge impact on your ecosystem. Any other questions? I'm sorry. I try to be as succinct as possible because I, I know we have someone else coming behind us. Well, since we have so much time, do you want yes. to briefly describe what the Wakulla program is with the students and, and, yes. and what that is working to do? Yes, yeah, so we've had about 100 students come through our program so far, and some have gone on to create their own. Uh, each one we try to encourage it. Well, we encourage them to start their own company. They have to have their own LLC, <clears throat> and each company would have at least three employees. Some have gone on and gone further and started their own distribution and processing facilities. Um, and I could probably name a few of them. Oyster Boss, um, I don't want to give any, and I maybe shouldn't name them. But uh, if you go on our social media website, then you can see some of the businesses that have come. Uh, the Oyster Company is one, he is here today, as a matter of fact, with us. Um, but this has had such a dramatic effect on, on the industry, not only the oyster aquaculture farmers themselves, but all the ancillary businesses that come from that. Um, when you're talking about scallop research, which is what we plan on going into, and clams, uh, all of a sudden now the dive shop down the street, you know, you kind of think about these things as you move forward and you're trying to impact the economic uh, environment in, a, in an area, is, all, is now all, all of a sudden getting people or customers to come in to do scallop, to do scalloping. Um, but everything that we try to do out of our program is, is for you to start your own business and to help the enterprise. Uh, and we want to make sure that they're fully uh, aware and informed about um, the oyster aquaculture industry. You're not going to know it all in one year. And you actually, actually have to get out on the boat and in the water to learn it. And so what we try to do is incorporate all of those aspects, not only classroom, which is about 16 weeks, but being out on the boat with us as a requirement for you to actually get to learn how to grow your oysters and for you to be successful. So we normally say from the first year you start off at 100,000 and then you double it every year and then you should learn your crop by then. The goal is to get to a million oysters per lease. Our goal is to be the number one producer of oysters in the area um, at about 50 million. And I may be wrong in that number, maybe 500 million is maybe or more aspirable goal for us because I think we can quite quickly get the 50 million. Um, but the limitation that we've had from this is the development of seed for the farmer. We need more nursery hatcheries, which would have a huge impact on the industry if we could stabilize that type of, uh, uh, that part of the industry to allow for more farmers to be able to grow more. Any other questions before I kind of go on? I don't want to just keep rambling. My time is up. Thank you. No, that's okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Well, we will keep moving on then. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Hoi Ping uh, from University of Florida, and uh, she is a second year award winner. So this is a continuation of ongoing work, and uh, take it away. And you have the remote, and if you want to lower this, yeah. then we can make it comfortable. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hoi Ping Yang, and uh, I'm from University of Florida. And my talk and, uh, will be the induction of the oyster tetraploid founders to address the triploid seed production for the Gulf oyster uh, industry. Uh, okay. Before my talk, I would love to make the acknowledgement first. Firstly, I want to acknowledge the Gulf State Marine Fisheries Commission. Thank you so much for this uh, support of this product. We know this product is really valuable for the Gulf uh, in, uh, oyster industry. And secondly, I would love to and acknowledge the industry organizations in Florida. The, Florida Shellfish Aquaculture Association and the Cedar Key Aquaculture Association, both of them very supportive to this product. 
most importantly for the industry collaborator farms in the two years, like uh, Mr. Steve said, in the past two years, all of these farms and they helped uh, with the, this project uh, because this project they need a year-round uh, culture for oyster. And of course, for my graduate student and undergraduate stu student and the staff and in the lab, because this project uh, is uh, very intense, especially in the spawning season. We need uh, a whole team and uh, put uh, the effort uh, to that. We, I will show you the pictures later. So I would. Uh, Without uh, all of this collaborative, this effort, uh, this project cannot uh, go. So I wanted to make the acknowledgement. We all know that 85% uh, of the national total oyster, um, eastern oyster, I would say, the aquaculture is from the Gulf. And uh, that's the, the survey from the 2011 and also since in Florida, since 2012, the oyster landing for the fisheries, especially from Apalachicola area, and is coming down. And because of that, the oyster aquaculture is really increasing so rapidly. And just because I'm working at in the, in the Florida, I'm just taking Florida as an example. Um, Florida and has established the infrastructure for shellfish, for shellfish aquaculture because of the hard clams. And for hatcheries, traditionally have a non-listed hatcheries. And actually last month, or I say this year, I just knew, I just um, got to know there's two more new hatcheries. And there's a nursery, it's a, a 31, and the grow out of farms about 378. And based on the Florida Agriculture Department, there's data, whoever have the business, you need to register for there. Um, based on this data, you would see right now, the oyster uh, aquaculture in Florida only is uh, uh, over 400 acres. They claim that they will do the oyster aquaculture. So uh, I think that's Albert also talking about the seed, the triploid seed. For all of the aquaculture, oyster aquaculture, triploid oyster are the preferred by the industry farms. For this talk, I do not want to spend time to see how good the triploid would be, but uh, I would just wanted to focus. If you want a triploid seed, tetraploids are absolutely needed for the commercially 100% triploid seed production. By the way, use the diploid females tetraploid males, and they cross each other, produce 100% triploid seed. To produce um, a, a tetraploid per, um, program, based on this research actually started from 1980, so that's take a lot, a lot of like a challenge. And uh, uh, currently, the method which can be able to use the, to produce viable tetraploid adults is uh, should it go through this approach. First, uh, you want to produce triploids based on the diploid, cross diploids, and the second step would be able to use the triploid female cross with the diploid male and uh, through the manipulation of the polar body and then produce the tetraploid founders. And the then after that, you would have to increase the tetraploid numbers to build up a breeding stock based on the number or based on the genetic background. After the tetraploid breeding population established, that's probably can be used for the triploid seed production and also be used for other research about like the population or the physiology reproduction and the research about the tetraploids. So uh, Steve said this project is not one year, that's for sure. It's not like one year you can get this done. Choose our first term we got funded on the 2017 and then 2018, we both and uh, to produce triploids. So you will see we the brood stock all collected from the different locations in uh, Florida, west coast, 
of Florida, not the east coast of Florida. We be able to get the oysters and uh, do the spawning. We do the dissection strip spawning and they do a lot of treatment, a lot of lab work and the hatchery work and be able to produce chemically, trip, chemically induced triploids. That's the results from 2017. We be able to, that's the spawning, that's the spawning uh, dates, and then three groups we produced that that's many uh, seed. And uh, this seed, uh oh, this seed was uh, cultured when they are growing up in the year one. That's that will go to the 2018 spawning season, March to May. What we bring them in, that's, that's the 2018 spawning season uh, we did. It's a whole, it's a, it's a whole uh, a load of work. You will see the first day we bring in the oysters and clean them up, line them up in the plates. And the one uh, students will measure the uh, body size, and the body weight. And then second students would open that one. We take a smear of the gonad. Be able to, once the, under the microscope, we will see which one is female, which one is male. We separate them. And then another student would, would go take one piece of the gill from each oyster. We will decide. We go through, stain them, go th filter the sample, run with the flow cytometer individually, we will know which one is triploid, which one is diploid. And finally, we will be able to find triploid females and then use them, be able to produce the eggs for the tetraploid uh, induction. So that's overall, and uh, for the whole year of the 2008, 18 spawning season, we totally, we um, processed 4,334 oysters. And uh, among this, we confirmed 2,060, uh, this uh, 12 triploids, and this is a triploid uh, um, percentage. Among the females, at a, you know, large, large amount of triploids is an uh, undeveloped uh, gonad. So, among this large number, and we found like 41 of them is a female. I personally feel like I'm so surprised when I got uh, based on the years of experience working on this in this field. That's uh, uh, so totally the female, the triploid female percentage is 1.57 percent. That means not too bad for the year one triploids. The so from these triploid females, we did the, each of them, we be able to collect the eggs. You will see most of them just have uh, so few eggs. That's just, uh, it's, it's reasonable just because of the triploid, uh, there's a genetic uh, nature. So only three of them and is over one million. So you, no matter what and whatever the eggs and the produce, the way you do the spawning, no matter how few the eggs are, we combine them, we'll be able to do some spawning. Okay. So from here, I wanted to show you in the, the, in the same group, they are from the same father, mother, the same group. This is a deployed female. See, the gonad is really huge, but this is the triploid female. They are kind of very, very um, re retarded, I would say retarded. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, because we did the whole measurement of the each oyster for all of the data and based on the date, based on the population, three population, where they cultured, uh, when did we uh, bring them in, and uh, their size, their body weight, we did all of this measurement. I would say uh, this data, because it's two big numbers, 4,000 data a point, uh, I do not have a, a conclusion here yet. I just want to show you an example here. 
And then for the triploid, you would say triploid male. Not we call the males. Actually, they are not really males because they are not do not have sperm. We try to run the flow cytometer. We will see if they didn't develop the, what their gonad development. We take a piece of gonad, take a piece of the gonad. We run the flow cytometer, the ploidy. You will see there's different types of the. It's very interesting, uh, like. A, Funding, I would, I would say, they have uh, this uh, major six or I would say five types. Some of them, that's, uh, that is a triploid peak. All the, here, the red one is a sperm peak should be, the diploid sperm peak should be. You see that for the triploids, they are kind of some, of, some of the triploids and uh, the pantaploids. But this is a, more like a laboratory intended. I do not want to talk to this too much. But I would just say, for this project, I want to talk about the challenges for here. The challenge, the first one is the limited availability of the O set, we call the O set, the X, from the triploid females. Um, this is uh, um, for actually for all of in the previous research, all talking about that really have a very, very low uh, availability of the X. For us, our data shows 1.5% of the triploid and the triploid can produce 100 to 1 point million X. This is the year one triploids. They are still young. And uh, so that's not too bad, that's to me. To me, that's, I feel like this is not too bad. The further improvement we will do is uh, we still have this triploids this year. And actually, I go back to the lab. We'll start to work on this. That they will be year two. When they are older, tend to be more female, tend to be like a, produce more eggs. And the second uh, um, improvement uh, we want to do it, thinking to do, we tried to conditioning of this triploids for the gonad enhancement. So we just in the, uh, November and uh, um, January, we built up an insulated uh, recirculating uh, tank with the temperature control. Hopefully this year, the spawning, we will have more female with more egg. The second challenge would be the uh, poor survival of the induced tetraploid larvae. Uh, based on the research for the Pacific oyster, the survival of the putative tetraploid larvae would be 0.0739%. That means you, at least you have to one million egg to start, be based on this low survival. For our data, I, we did all of the spawning. All of the, oil, the larvae, it looks pretty good in the first few days, and, but they die out at the day seven to day 10. The, this picture shows like the, you see, only this one survived. There's a lot of empty shells. Um, the solution, what I'm trying to thinking about this, the whole, uh, through this project, we will increase the uh, egg quality by conditioning the triploid because in 2018, we just bring the oysters in and they put them in the refer not uh, a cooler and we process them within two days or three days. This year, we will put them in the water because make them, I will, would assume that they will be feel much better in, this, in the water rather than in the cooler. So another, uh, uh, Solution, our improvement we would be take good care of the larvae, that's for sure. Oh, gosh. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is, uh, actually, this is the larvae we produced, uh, uh, lost, uh, the putative tetraploid larvae. Just, just means the group is, uh, yeah. You see, that's the day, um, day five. They look, uh, every, everybody looks happy. They are kind of very, a lot of larvae. And then in the day 10, uh, lots of them would, uh, that's the one, one uh, oyster. I believe this one, in this group, we only have three survived. So in one, in one group, the culture in one farm, and they survived about several hundreds survived and grew up to the um, kind of uh, this size. We planned to pre bring them um, inside the lab to confirm the ploidy individually and by uh, the end of February this year. But when I contacted that farm and I was told that that's, uh, 
unfortunate that this oysters will suffer a s accident death. So, but uh, it, we will continue this year. You know, that's the way only to go. With that, I would uh, thank you for listening. Are there any questions? To work on, yeah. The, so, uh, any any explanation why your numbers are an order of magnitude higher in terms of viability for uh, oocyte production uh, from your tetra your uh, triploid females versus what Supan uh, published? Yeah, um, I would say for the occurrence of the triploid female and the egg production from the triploids, it really depends where you culture them. You see that for, for this research, 2017, the same father and mother, the same group who actually we separated them with, some of them culture in Cedar Key, some of them culture in the Wakala County. And uh, you know, that's uh, even the same group, the, 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 I mean the brother and sisters, and the, you culture them in a different location, it's come out differently. This could be related to Environmental, the food availability, the temperature, salinity, a lot of a lot of different factors. Actually, for this product, I'm I'm a little bit surprised that for year one triploid we can find like 41 females. You see the Dr. Supens and the report. He found like one in 16 in 1,600. So it took him, uh, I believe, he said it took him almost 10 years to get that. Uh, tetraploid uh, established. But yeah, so, so it's an order of magnitude, actually uh, more than an order of magnitude difference. What you found was a, your, your rate of oocyte production or, or a, you know, a, a female capable of pr reproducing that's a, that's a triploid. I'm, I'm, I'm really asking you a question. If I'm understanding what you presented correctly, you found something that's a, an order of magnitude higher than what we all had been, or at least speak for myself, had, had previously been assuming mm -hmm. was the rate of viability, if you want to call it that, in terms of able to reproduce if, if it's a triploid. So you're, what I understood you just say is you think that's due to environmental conditions, but also potentially the, the line that that particular triploid came from, the, the, the genetic be. line. That could be. Okay. Okay. We you, do not. But you, but you don't have, really know, of course. I just, yeah. No, we have okay. no, because we didn't do the parallel. Um, right. Well, that's fascinating because I, I think a lot of people in the field are, are under the assumption that basically triploids don't reproduce, that it's a, uh, I know I've heard Supan use the term a blue moon um, female that is able to reproduce. And, you know, with one in 1600, yeah, that, that would be, that would be inaccurate. But, it, but yeah. one in or almost two in a hundred is uh, a much more, uh, much higher rate, obviously. But you remember, and, uh, if I, the, that I'm, I'm thinking you have another concern, the triploid uh, culture in the wild, uh, they can't produce the eggs or something. But uh, this uh, research is based on stripping spawning. We have to kill the triploids, be able to, stripping the eggs out. But if you put them naturally, let them spawn, even if they have eggs or them, they may not spawn. That's another like a barrier. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we're staying close to schedule. Um, 
Next up, John Scarper of Texas A&M, and uh, he's going to present on the work he's doing. This is a second year, also continuation of a previous project, sort of the follow-up project. So. Thank you. <clears throat> so yes, uh, this is a follow-up project. Uh, this is identification, identifying potential user conflicts and solutions for off-bottom oyster culture in Texas. There it goes. So <clears throat> this uh, wonderful map of the US, it's an old data map now. We'll hope we uh, get our USDA data. But one of the things you see if you look at Texas is we don't have any sales in oyster aquaculture, cultured oysters. Uh, we're the only state in the U.S. that does not have shellfish aquaculture rules. Now, Georgia, and I have question marks here um, because of other things, Georgia does shellfish. They still, too, are actually awaiting oyster aquaculture because of gear restrictions. It's only gear. We joke always about who's racing to the bottom. We definitely are the bottom. Um, now, it's not that we, uh, that Texas doesn't do aquaculture. It's about a $60 million business. There are many departments that are involved in it. So it's there. It's just that we don't do anything in coastal waters. And we have a nice coast. Florida is about 1,350. Many of you know that I used to be in Florida for 20 years. So came to Texas going, really, why are you bringing me over here? We don't do it, and that's why. Louisiana, 400, and we have about 370. And primarily, it's going to be Copano Bay up to uh, Galveston Bay, where most of the wild fishery happens. And we have an active wild fishery managed as good as it can any other wild fishery can be. I always say I, I couldn't be a natural resource manager. You never please everybody. Uh, and over the years, they've done really well. And if you look historically, looking at this period, you know, it's about 5 million pounds meat weight per year. It's not too bad, ups and downs. Of course, Ike came along, BP, and we've had spring rains that have really decimated it. And it's not that Texas hasn't looked at aquaculture before. Uh, Dr. DeMichael, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago, had done some very early work to show that it's economically viable. Did it with Sammy Ray, and Sammy actually used to not be a proponent of aquaculture, so he was finally slow changing his mind, too. And Texas Parks and Wildlife really, when I got down there, they said, look, we see it, too. We need it. And this is a timeline that they were doing that they were scoping to do an oyster aquaculture plan. And don't worry about the details here. As much as they were looking at it, there really was something. And during that time, items came up and it was like, what's going on? Why can't we do it? And it looked like there were some problems with legislative action, that Texas Parks and Wildlife didn't have the authority. And as a newcomer, I kind of questioned that a little bit. And this is where the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission uh, allowed me to go out to actually ask people. One, one more. It's thinking, right? There it goes. To look, to go around, talk to state agencies, talk to some of our non-governmental organizations, and talk to the fishers now, the wild fishermen, now saying, what do you see? Do you really have a problem with aquaculture? What's really going on in our state? Why isn't it here after considering the rest of the US and around the world does it? And what we found was no group was opposed. It was only 12 groups, four state agency, four non-governmental, four uh, fishers. But no group was opposed to aquaculture. They're like, we, we can do it. It shouldn't be a problem. They all mention sustainability, basic things. Hey, if you're going to do it, let's do it sustainable, especially siting, seagrass, um, some genetic things. We do have a genetic con discontinuity between a, quote, northern Texas and a southern Texas oyster somewhere just north of Copano Bay, similar to Florida, where there's the east coast, west coast, or gulf. And the real question came up about state agency authority. So it really was reaffirmed that no state agency really had the authority to regulate oyster aquaculture or shellfish culture in Texas. So those impediments really came up as state agency authority, support for increased costs, right? So if we're going to expand, that was one thing that came up. State Department of Health says, hey, look, how, how are we going to look at this? Law enforcement, how are we going to make sure things are going correct? And of course, spatial planning. And one of the things that kept coming up from everybody was user conflicts. And that's what led me to the second part of this project, because I realized I hit these large groups, which I really thought would be a problem, but we all realized that basic stakeholders are coastal uh, landowners. What's going to happen if we see that? Who are the other users and are there going to be problems? 
So I went out and we did the basic user conflicts. We know we're looking now at gear that's not going to be in bottom or off, just slightly off the bottom, right, out of people's eye vision, but that you can be seen either using adjustable long lines or floating. And so it was a very simple thing. Go out and talk, see different groups, right, Try, ask people what's going on, and we talked. And we talked again, right? You get, get to, because it is, how much stakeholder, really, what's going on? What, what can I find out? Really trying to find a person who would say, this is just off the wall. And I did find those people. There it goes. So I did a very, very basic survey with these groups. There was a pre-presentation survey. I had a list of questions to try to get demographics. But really, part of it was coming down to, what is your general opinion of aquaculture? And then what is your opinion of bivalve aquaculture, using positive, negative, or no opinion? There are always people like, hey, I don't know enough. And then, of course, afterwards, I did the same question, post-presentation, what's going on? And the other questions was, is there an impediment or concern you have with allowing off-bottom culture? And do you have a solution? Those were fun ones. It really was. Hey, there are lots of people we're going to ask. Well, <clears throat> this is just a partial uh, table of what's going on. There's just three groups here that I presented. So pre presentation, you look up and you realize there's various groups, uh, various proportions that even know about aquaculture, really understand it. And that last group, which is, uh, which is the lowest there, is a group that have a lot of what we you know call our winter Texans, right? Like anybody that come down Texas just for the winter. And uh, so they're landlocked in a lot of ways, but still, you know, a third or more knew about it. Post-presentation, I was really glad that most of them then had an increased uh, feeling about well, positive. And these are all positive responses uh, about it, not just about aquaculture. And that when we look at that change, it's really nice. So I was really glad at least I was bringing a point across to them. What's going on? You know, is this something good? Some people actually turned around and said it's not good. I did have a couple of those, and that's why I got to go back into the data and actually look exactly who I was going up and down with. But in general, most people, after hearing a presentation, understand aquaculture. culture. So it's part of that general education that we have to do, that we realize that as we're going out to try to get things changed, we have to get the public behind us. Now, some of the comments, just a few, just to see, because they all wrote out comments. It's really fun transcribing these things. Uh, uh, negative uh, concerns, navigation restriction. Everybody understands this. Hey, it's going to get in the way of recreational boating. Make sure it doesn't get in the way of energy, right? Our, Texas, big energy exporter, Corpus Christi Bay, our, our port, fourth largest uh, by tonnage in our state, first in energy in the U.S. Uh, lack of uh, public understanding of benefits. We've talked about this. Albert did a good thing. Hey, this really can help. And then that industrial visual impact, that aesthetics. People live along the coast. What can we do? And we have plenty of places along the coast that don't have coastal homeowners, but you always wonder where development will go. The other ones, of course, would be things like select barren areas, away from shoreline and popular fishing areas. Use high-density farms, which I was glad that people understood that, hey, if we put in certain areas, it'll be easier to monitor, easier to see, and everybody knows it. Uh, clearly, Mark, education programs, more bottom culture to offset any loss of access, kind of interesting. People had asked me when I first came down, what type of oyster culture would you, you know, accept? For me, I mean, if it came down to cages on bottom, I'd be fine with that. I would be, just because we get that first step and hopefully get to the next one. <clears throat> we'll see where it goes. Uh, minimize visual impacts. Start small. Interesting. Like anybody, don't start too big. Let's just see how it works. We'll see where it goes. A couple others, in my opinion, it's better to let Mother Nature take its course to produce oysters on its own. Obviously a person that doesn't want aquaculture, right? <laughs> let the professionals handle what's happening. Apparently it works in other parts of the country need to follow other states. It's, it's great that I let, I've really enjoyed letting people write, okay, in that. It's just that open-ended question. What do you think? You've gotten everything. And, and I do have a couple of hardcore that say, you know, this aquaculture shouldn't be done, period, okay? <clears throat> But what really came out of all this? So over the past uh, five years that I've been back in Texas, as well as with this support running around to different agencies, this legislative session in Texas, House Bill 1300 would introduce to allow Texas Parks and Wildlife to have the authority to initiate culture. So over this time, uh, things are moving along nicely. And I heard it has moved past the first hurdle, and it's now on the calendar. Uh, so that means it should be coming up for vote, and we all keep our fingers crossed that by the end, beginning of May, when our session ends, that this will have passed. Um, Texas is an unusual state, right? We meet every other year legislatively. We're biennial. Uh, one of the nice things with 
with this bill, Texas Parks and Wildlife, Coastal Conservation Association, other groups got behind to discuss it. And part of it is it's a very simple bill. It allows oyster aquaculture, or actually in Texas, it's going to be called oyster mariculture, okay? And they have their reasons for that. Oyster mariculture. Uh, and that is it. It enables us to do this. This allows regulation to take place by the Texas Parks and Wildlife Commission, which meets about quarterly or more. Uh, and that way, regulatory things can change more often instead of waiting for legislative action. So we're real happy with how things have gone. I think the education program, talking to people, has really allied many fears that could have been out there of what's going on. I've been surprised at the uh, perception of aquaculture by some people who I would have expected to know more about what aquaculture is, especially oyster mariculture. So with that, I thank you. I thank the assistance of our extension agents who helped me get some of these meetings. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to take them. Pass that man a mic. <laughs> I heard you say that uh, y'all were able to pass this in Texas if you called it mariculture instead of aquaculture. It's not that it will pass, it's just it, legislatively they want that language and that's at the political end. For some reason it's called oyster mariculture to separate it out from some of the other aquaculture that occurs. That's because those are two separate types of growing. It is. You know, on bottom is a mariculture transplant natural product where aquaculture is started uh, off, sh off of the, not within the growing area. No, okay, aquaculture, right, is the controlled cultivation of any aquatic organism. Mariculture is the controlled cult cultivation of any marine organism. That's strictly the difference between those two words. But in their language, they want to call it oyster mariculture. Okay, and so I had no problem with that because it is. It's, well, it's is, controlled I'm just gonna, there it, is a lot of confusion then. Confusion on, on for what? Because what mariculture was always taught to people in the industry, at least as long as I've been in it, and I've been in it 40 years, that is trans, that, that mariculture was a, a transplanting action to cultivate oysters to grow fatter and fuller so is, in certain is, so areas. Is, that yeah, was so like, is that a legislative definition that's been passed on in, in, in what state? In Louisiana. So is that a legislative language? It was, uh, I don't know if you knew Ron Duga, but Ron yeah. used that language. Yeah. Um, Corky Perrette used that language. And that's uh, one of the problems. And, that, right. and uh, legislatively, I don't see where mariculture is even written in. It was a, something that the biologists that were within the resource agencies used to describe that process right to so see and, and that's it it was obviously very specific to louisiana about sea transfer it's just as in texas it's not called uh it's not the galveston leases are not called leases anybody texas help me what is I it again certificate of what lease. They, they call them leases. we call them leases technically what is certificate of thank you so, okay and that's it we speak differently than than policy so many times so I, that's just like many things we speak differently so legislatively, hey, they're calling it mariculture. I have no trouble in Texas with them calling it mariculture. People wonder sometimes, you know, because it is, you look even at controlled cultivation, how far down the line do we go to mariculture? So is, um, is what they do in Galveston Bay on a private lease, certificate of location, right, the formal, formal uh, area, where they put shell down, okay, put shell or substrate, is that a form of aquaculture mariculture? And some people argue yes, because you, a person has interfered with Mother Nature. That is, they put the substrate down. If that substrate wasn't there, it wouldn't be. It would be the lowest form of mariculture, aquaculture, right, to, to just change the basic area. It would be like going out on a grassland, pulling up the grass, and now saying, okay, Mother Nature, come in and, and put plant corn seed without you actually putting the corn seed down. So, you know, it's just one of those little things. That, that, I mean, if you even go back to you know, Moore and Pope, both of those guys never taught, use the term mariculture or aquaculture. But they did use culture material. Right. They did right. talk about culture and material. Putting, right. Yeah, I, I, 
the, you know, in my mind, and particularly in Louisiana, mariculture was used probably for the same reason that the legislators in Texas want to use it, is they wanted to draw a line between aquaculture, which had some negative connotations in other parts of the country, and what was currently being done in Louisiana, which was a very extensive form of aquaculture, right. which you're, you're describing, John, yeah. with just placement of culch and control of the area, but very low control of the right. life cycle. And so, you know, I, I would say traditionally mariculture and aquaculture in the, in the world has been used somewhat interchangeably. Mm -hmm. um, that's in my mind anyway. Yeah. But the, the question I wanted to ask you is, is the, isn't some of the drive behind the development of aquaculture or mariculture of oysters in Texas, the, the hatchery reared yeah. animal, yeah. Um, is that being driven by the restaurant industry somewhat? That's my understanding. So the restaurant industry, Texas Restaurant Association has gotten behind this. Um, they would like to have more Texas product uh, and, and yes, so they, they've been behind this also. Like I said, it's been very, uh, very supportive by different groups. Uh, so John, uh, Bill Walton, just I thought it was interesting. You said that, uh, um, if I understood you, that no state agency had the authority. Uh, so to split hairs here a little bit, I've been under the impression that um, the legislation was needed to give permission to do this. but. In a state where nobody has the authority to regulate it, couldn't people just do it? So interesting, yeah. <laughs> it, you, you know, usually most states act that way, and for some, Texas is an opposite. If, if it, it, and don't ask me how it's known, but uh, it was something early on I learned. It's like, well, hold it. If you don't have regulations or anything, why can't we just do it? And they're like, well, then you can't do it because we haven't said so. And it really is. It's like if it's not written that you can do this, you can't do this. I don't know if it always holds true, but in general, that was it. So if anybody would go forward and ask, there's like, well, there's nothing here that allows you to do it, so no, you shouldn't do it. It's not illegal. It was just that you shouldn't, you can't do it. So the, yeah, if you did it, you weren't really breaking any laws, right? <laughs> but they were like, you shouldn't be doing that. So yeah, and, and the permission part, actually, that with the legislative, really, the authority is that Texas Parks and Wildlife, and this is the agency that it's going under, versus something like Texas Department of Agriculture, they already have the oyster chapters for fishery and all that. So it makes sense, that even though they're, you know, I look at it as a uh, resource, natural resource, this isn't a resource, right? So I come from you know, other states, right, that you think of it as an agricultural product. Um, it makes sense within Texas that TPWD will be the agency that now is given that regulatory authority and can levy those little um, uh, permit fees and that was part of it. They couldn't do what fees, how does the fee structure? And so if this all passes, we still have a year, I hope it's only a year or two, still for regulatory process to take place for them to scope and figure out exactly what is the fee structure going to be for all this and how is it all going to happen. We have a long way to go. <laughs> John. John Bell, I'm with um, NOAA Fisheries visiting. And I, I, my, I have a question. The way you define mariculture, if I understood that right, it was not necessarily that it's marine waters, but it's a marine organism. So you technically could take a marine organism and do it like if it was on land, then it would be mariculture? Well, if, if it was being done on land and marine, I, you know, it is. I think we get into that wordplay here. Yeah. So okay. shrimp, Pacific white shrimp can be done at one part per thousand, which is technically fresh water. Would a person say mariculture or aquaculture? Like I said, th these, these um, you know, we don't have a lot of them legislatively defined in some state I think Florida actually has aquaculture defined what it is uh, but in, in other states you know we don't so um, yeah it's when people ask what is the difference it's like hey one's marine one's you know everything one's the umbrella marine is strictly struck and I usually use marine organisms because it makes people think a little bit easier than just saying salt water you know like, oh marine organism even that's kind of highbrow for some of them from the sea, you know, you have to use. And it, and it is, it's, it's been a real good eye opener for me going out to see the public. And one fast part I forgot to mention, most of these uh, surveys, of course, groups that come out for it are older individuals. Um, in two weeks, I'm actually running down uh, to a different part of Texas and, and hopefully we'll be getting some younger input. Uh, couldn't do it in, the, in my own school because unfortunately there's authoritative things, that whole IRB, institutional review boards, when they go, I was like, oh, I can't do it in my class because the students will feel compelled. 
One of the reasons you see the end values change, in case you've ever done it right, people who do these surveys, you can answer, you can't answer, it, it's all up to you, so you have these splotches. Some of them were real funny because they would mark, and I would swear what they did was they marked pre-test for post-test because there was no, nothing on the post-test, and it's like, well, there's no answer. I can't say anything. You know, I can't make assumptions about it. <laughs> we don't all follow instructions very well, do we? Uh, so times at times. Any last questions? Great. Thank you very much. So we're completely on schedule, thank you. Our uh, next presenter is Beth Walton, and she's going to do a, uh, a presentation here on the project they've been working on, which is more of an outreach yes. kind of approach. Absolutely. Yes. Good morning. I'll be talking to you all about a group I'm working with called Oyster South, uh, and it's Lessons from the Dirty Dozen, which actually turns out Lessons from the Baker's Dirty Dozen. <laughs> so with that, we'll get started. So what I'd like to do is just give you a little background on what Oyster South is, and then talk specifically about what the funds were used for to help us move the awareness of oyster aquaculture in the South forward. Um, in the beginning, Oyster South, we began as a very informal coalition of oyster farmers, extension agents, restaurateurs. So pretty informal, a great group, but we didn't really have a framework uh, to fundraise. So in 2016, we did form into a 501c3 to help support the southern oyster farming community. So this includes, as I say, pretty much everybody who's interested in southern farm-raised oysters, whether you just like to eat them, or you're a, a, a farmer, a chef, a shucker, distributor, et cetera. Lots and lots of people interested who support that mission. Or if you're someone like me who likes to talk and likes to eat oysters and talk about eating oysters, <laughs> this is the community. So essentially, we have two branches. One is what I call the industry. Um, as I mentioned, I put a whole list of different people up here, uh, folks that are members. There are some that are in this room today who are here, who are members of Oyster South. And right now, that portion of the membership has grown to over 200 people, and it continues to grow. We also have the general public branch, and that is something that we're working to develop as well. And this consists of people who are not necessarily growing or um, you know, involved in transporting oysters. They're the people who want to just go out and eat and enjoy the experience. And they don't really want to know about the filtration rate of oysters, or they say, oh, too much science. We just want to eat, you know, that, those kind of folks. So of course, we're always happy to have them as well. But this is something we're working to develop and get more people involved on this side of it. So some of the other things that we do, as I mentioned, this is a picture of John Pelley in Savannah, Georgia, eat oysters. <laughs> but one of the primary things we are also involved with is fundraising. Uh, and one of those uh, events happens every October. So save the date, everybody, October 20th <laughs> in Decatur, Georgia. It's called Landlocked. Um, we bring together lots of farmers from across the southeast and also from other parts of the country. Uh, the other thing that we do is we facilitate information exchange. We have an annual symposium that alternates between the Atlantic Coast and the Gulf Coast. I'll be talking more about those a bit later. We also have a, um, a newsletter that gets sent out quarterly. We are involved in several grant-funded efforts. And another important part of what we do, in addition to me getting up here and, and telling you all about it, is just helping the community to tell their story and how best to do that in overall promoting not just the farmers, but the whole movement, the whole community. And we also get some fairly decent media coverage from this, and we always try to encourage that among our members and to new folks. So as I mentioned, Landlocked is our annual fundraiser. Each year that we've done this, we've done it for two years now, we've raised over $20,000 each year. We've had about 300 or so people attend. It continues to grow. We we're thinking of having a bigger venue, but we might stay at the same location because it's just, it seems to be just the, right, just the right size. 
as I mentioned, several oyster farmers and other chefs. We also have um, some pit masters. They do barbecue. <laughs> Let me tell you, that has ruined me. I cannot eat barbecue except from the folks indicator. It's quite delicious. Um, and again, a ticketed event for the general public. There's not presentations that happen like this. That, that's more the focus of the symposium. So this is really a, a more informal setting for people to get to put a face to the farmer who's growing the oyster that they love to eat at the raw bar. Uh, the first year, all of the proceeds were donated to the University of Georgia and their uh, shellfish farming efforts to help them move forward uh, to their shellfish laboratory and to help assist that state. And the second year, which was just this past fall, 2018, all of the net proceeds went to a program called the Need for Seed, which I'll um, you know, speak about in a bit, but it went entirely to that uh, to help develop folks to be able to get more seed based on just all of the weather, the severe weather we had last fall. I guess it's because I'm short, I'm just saying. Okay, we, we supported other events as well. Some of these include uh, local and regional events. One is called Pete and Pearls, which takes place in Pensacola, Florida. Also, we participated in the Hangout Oyster Festival a new annual event in Charleston called Shucked and Sauced, which I said you guys won the, be the prize for best title. That was a good one. And also this year, the Panacea Oyster Festival. So, you know, we usually try to have some of our member farms or some representative at these. And so we're really pleased to see people rallying behind the unifying theme, which is the Southern Farm Raised Oyster. I'll bring a step stool next time, Steve, sorry. <laughs> so in addition to assisting and helping other farmers and other community members, one of the things, just in general, I think people, you, you, it's nice to accept help from others. And this year, we were very, very lucky to have other people assist the oyster, our, our community, the Oyster South community. I just listed a few here. Um, the Finn and Fina restaurant up in North Carolina, they have this really interesting program that dedicates, they take each month, they have a, a fixed price menu, and then they have a particular charity that they benefit. And this past year, they chose Oyster South to have us be the beneficiaries. So we were really pleased to hear that. And their servers actually go to the table and explain to the customers, okay, this is the charity, or this is the group, and this is what they do, and this is why we're supporting it. So it was a nice way to get more education out into the public. Uh, the second folks were Parlo Beer Lab. That is probably the prettiest picture of beer and oysters that I've seen in a while. They're actually right here in New Orleans. So if anybody is interested in going having a pint of oyster stout, go see Eric, tell him we sent you. <laughs> um, and they donated a dollar a pint to Oyster South. Uh, and also the Panhandle Proud effort over in Calif uh, California, sorry, in Florida, not California. Um, was to assist folks uh, to help recover from the hurricanes. And so there were t-shirts made and a portion of those t-shirt sales were donated to Oyster South to help assist those farmers as well. Information exchanges I mentioned, our symposium, our newsletter, and also um, uh, some of the other projects that we're involved with called the Peer-to-Peer -peer Program. And we were also uh, funded by the Turner Foundation to help address some hurdles to aquaculture in the state of Georgia that could also help um, you know, provide guidance to other states. You know, as John Scarpa just mentioned, there's other folks that are looking to start oyster aquaculture as well. So it was a nice way to kind of start something to get a central location of lots of information on hurdles to aquaculture. The Peer-to-Peer -peer Fellowship Program, uh, we were also involved with this, and this is sort of a, um, like a grower exchange where people would go and fill out a small application uh, and then request funds to go to meetings or to other forums or in some cases to other countries. Uh, we worked with the National Sea Grant Program on this and growers from across the south went all over the places I mentioned. Some went to Canada and Australia and even Thailand. 
Uh, we helped promote this effort with additional funds provided to us. So we're very, very happy. And you can see some of the, the photos on the bottom there. Actually, in the bottom right, it's Grand Isle Sea Farms. They are a small family farm here in Louisiana, and they hosted some of the growers from Barrier Island from South Carolina. So it was a nice way to kind of cross-pollinate with one another. As I mentioned, overall brand promotion, these are just a few of the examples that we have of different uh, TV shows, magazine publications, and so forth. I mean, I like to say we're kind of like a, a concierge almost, like people call with things like, hey, where can we get good oysters? Or, hey, do you know this farmer? Can we come on a farm tour? So it's really exciting for us to be able to kind of, I call myself like the oyster matchmaker. <laughs> it's really great to try to to see how we can connect the dots of not only the southern oyster farming community, but how to plug the, everybody else in to people on the west coast and the east coast and even globally. Uh, so it, it really is um, quite satisfying and enjoyable to work with so many positive people. So our financial structure, as I mentioned, um, you know, all the proceeds from fundraising uh, go into grants. None of these funds are used for our operating expenses. Our annual symposium is intended to cover any costs. And also, we're supported by member dues, newsletter advertising, merchandise, and grants. And anybody who attended our last symposium knows it was fogged in for three straight days, even though it was right on the beach, like you couldn't see the beach. Our sales of hoodies went through the roof. It's almost like we planned that, but we, <laughs> we didn't. <laughs> Y'all, I'm so sorry. Okay. So need for seed grants. As I mentioned, uh, this is a new program that we started uh, this past year. And so um, throughout the region, we all know the growth of the industry has led to a, a very increased demand for seed production. And with the severe weather this past fall due to the hurricanes, that situation was definitely exacerbated by it. So we raised funds this past year to support commercial oyster hatchery production that will help provide seed to commercial oyster farms in the region. So for the recipients for this year, um, folks submitted short applications. Our review committee did actually review them. And we have a very nice geographical spread of recipients all the way from South Carolina, Ladies Island Oyster, L3 Hatchery in Alabama, Mill Point Aquaculture in North Carolina, and Pensacola Bay Oyster Company in Florida, and then here in Louisiana, Triple N Oyster Farm. And I just want to mention too, we have a marine advisory board which consists of members, uh, marine extension agents from each state our territory goes from North Carolina around Florida and all the way over to Texas. And then we also have an expanded board of directors that encompasses not only the geography, but different segments. So we have farmers, we have shuckers, we have educators, we have chefs. So we try to have a, uh, not only geographic diversity, but also different sectors as well on our board of directors. So our symposia, we have had three so far. The first one was in 2017 in Auburn, Alabama. This is one of those things when you do a new event, we thought, well, if 20 people show up, awesome. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll be happy. But we had over 50 oyster farmers and about 100 people in total. So we were really pleased with that. The second year in Charleston, the numbers continued to grow. And we had over 175 attendees and about 100 farmers. This past year, in 2019, was in Orange Beach, and we topped over 235, and I mean, people were standing in the back. So we were really happy to see it continue to grow, because, you know, that first slide that I had up about the industry branch, then we had the, you know, consumer public branch, we realized if we didn't have industry buy-in, then, you know, the customers would say, well, what the heck is this about? But we were so... We're so happy to continue to see the support and enthusiasm from the industry side of things that we're just, we're really, really thrilled with it. So next year, when we go back to the Atlantic Coast, we're going to have to get a bigger venue, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so this is where the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission 
the funding came in for us. It was very helpful to bring in, I've listed the group of people, to help add value to our program. And similar to the peer-to-peer -peer program where industry people went and visited other people around the country, what we did was we selected speakers that we thought would bring more to the table from different parts of the country and from different segments. And I'll just go through. So essentially, we're bringing, we're bringing people to the industry because not everybody had a chance to travel. So I'll just mention you know, some, of, some of each of who these people are and what they spoke about. So we put together a, storytel a storyteller's panel. And this was moderated by the folks that are bolded here, Jennifer Cornegay and Aaron Byers-Mari. Both folks are writers and authors. And some of the funds were also used to bring in another writer, Andre Gallant, and a filmmaker, Joe York. Um, and each of these people has, everybody who's listed on here has some connection to oysters, whether they're growers or the writers or the filmmakers. Joe actually worked for Southern Foodways Alliance and produced a short film called The Gospel of the Alabama Oyster a few years ago. Jennifer and Erin both are authors and writers and write pieces for The Local Palette, Bitter Southerner, and Garden and Gun. Also, everybody is an oyster fan, which helps immensely, <laughs> obviously. Um, the next uh, set of folks, they participated in a panel called The Importance or Not of Quality and it was basically um, talking about what folks look for in their oyster, whether you're a restaurateur, what does quality mean to you as a, a restaurant owner or a grower. That was moderated by Bill Walton, and funding was provided to a, uh, a farmer out of North Carolina, Ryan Belter, and to a wholesaler in Alabama, JT McKissick. Uh, the next panel was Lessons from the Storms, and three-minute tech talks as well. That funded, um, again, Ryan Belcher from North Carolina. He did, we had that guy working a lot, I'm just saying. <laughs> we put him on a lot of things. But in addition to the storms panel discussion with the, the hurricanes this past year, we have um, sort of, uh, we call it, Bill called it uh, lightning round talks. So three-minute tech talks where a grower would get up with either a cage or some innovation or something and have exactly three minutes to talk about something. And we realized at the end of the three minutes, the nice way to get them to stop talking, not even to stand up, people would clap, clap them off. It was perfect. <laughs> it worked really well. And finally, uh, the last number of uh, speakers that we had was rethinking how we think about sea transfers, Ryan Carnegie from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, oyster farming is restoration, Pete Malinowski from the Billion Oyster Project in New York. He came and talked to everyone. That was very interesting to hear about what they're doing with their oyster shell recycling project up in New York, their harbor school program, and also where the, the hatchery that they work with. And all of these things are great models for folks here in the Gulf. Uh, the Research Farm Network, given by Diane Murphy from the Cape Cod Cooperative Extension and Woods Hole Sea Grant. She talked a lot about all the data they're gathering from the different farms around the area and how that could be applied here in the South. And this might be my favorite talk uh, title, Revenge of the Nerds, Effects of Debt Financing on Your Heavy Sharp Rock Oyster Farm, <laughs> given by Matt Parker from the University of Maryland, all about the economics of oyster farming. Lessons from Tales of the Cocktail by Caroline Rosen here in New Orleans. An educated staff, the importance of server training from executive chef Julia Sullivan from Henrietta Red up in Nashville. And Finding Your Tribe from Becky Wasden of Two Girls, One Shuck here in New Orleans and also of the Auburn University Shellfish Lab. And all of these people, they talked about the lessons that they have learned from their work, whether it's craft cocktails and how to apply that model to what we do here with oyster farming staff education, server training from an executive chef who curates an awesome raw bar and how important that is for their servers to be educated to inform their consumers. And then finally, just finding your people in, in speaking about what, what speaks to you about the oyster and why you're involved and being authentic in telling what you do. And that's what people really connect with. I just want to thank the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission for the financial support. We could not have had such a great symposium without the support of y'all and bringing these great speakers. And hopefully all of this will help cultivate more oyster lovers. So with that, thank you for your time. And I don't know if we have time for questions, but thank you so much. OK, great. Thanks, Steve. 
or y'all can ask me later too. I know we're at break time. Great. All right, well, we are at a break. Okay. Uh, if there's no Thank questions, uh, I will tell you. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started again. If you could find your way to your seats. Um, I will remind you, if you came in after we started, uh, please sign in the back corner. There's a sign-in sheet. We'd like to get a record of all our attendees. Uh, I believe there may still be a few programs back there with abstracts. Uh, if not, we're going to have it available on our website after the meeting. Um, again, this is also being broadcast, streaming on our YouTube video channel. Uh, we don't have a great quality signal for the stream, but we'll have a high quality video up on the website uh, after this meeting. So these will be available after the fact for uh, viewing in perpetuity. So with nothing further, we're going to go ahead and get going. Um, I'm going to bring uh, Larry Marino up, and he's going to give us a little perspective on their project, um, more of a, a policy. I'll let you talk about it. Come on up. Addressing regulatory constraints. Uh, so uh, I'm Larry Marino. I'm an attorney in Louisiana, and I uh, uh, helped, actually helped draft and was the primary drafter for the uh, off-bottom uh, oyster aquaculture uh, laws and regulations and procedures. Uh, I've also teamed up for this grant with uh, some attorneys out of Washington who work with the shellfish growers up there uh, in the permitting and, uh, and dealing with the regulations. So we uh, kind of attack this from both sides. So our objectives generally were to identify regulatory constraints on off-bottom moisture aquaculture throughout the Gulf and to recommend regulatory changes to solve them. Uh, the primary uh, things that we did were to research the laws, regulations, procedures, programs, everything that goes with it, and then to interview the stakeholders, the regulators, uh, research, uh, uh, people and uh, extension agents, and some of them are, are, are here in the room. Thank you very much, Bill and Beth. We had about 60 interviews, and the point was to identify, as, all right, what's on paper is one thing, well, but what's really working, what's not working? So I don't think we really need to talk too much about the different techniques, but it's important to recognize that this is a new industry. Uh, it's, it's, it, it requires uh, ability, uh, flexibility to evolve uh, as means and methods change. There's two main parts to the regulatory framework. Uh, on, the, on the state side, the specifics vary a lot, but in general, there's going to be a grant of a property right, something that actually allows someone to use these uh, submerged lands, whatever they're called. We call them water bottoms in Louisiana, state-owned water bottoms. The second part is going to be some sort of a permit to actually authorize the operation there is technically a water quality, quality certification uh, that's an authority delegated from the federal government to the state that usually doesn't apply to uh, off-bottom moist aquaculture. Of course, there's operational regulation. Specifics vary, but I'm going to be spoke, uh, focusing on the first two, the property right and the uh, permit that's issued. The federal side, uh, the, the, the big one there is, well, sorry about the slide being messed up. Uh, the big one there is the, the Department of the Army permit, usually under Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act, uh, involving obstructions to navigation. There could be a Clean Water Act uh, permit required, uh, but usually since there is no dredge, uh, dis discharge of dredge to fill material, that's not required for off-bottom moisture aquaculture. There can also be a consultation required with respect to the Endangered Species Act and the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And there will be a, a United States Coast Guard uh, private aids to navigation uh, uh, certificate that's going to be required. So we'll talk briefly about what works in each state and what uh, might could be improved. And then we'll talk generally about the Gulf-wide recommendations. Alabama is really going gangbusters. Uh, they've got a, a very vibrant uh, oyster aquaculture uh, uh, participation. There's clear author authority for this. They call it shellfish aquaculture. Some states have particular terms for it. 
Uh, the agencies seem to have been quite supportive, and there is a lot of uh, support in the academic and uh, uh, extension communities. And there are also pre-permitted oyster parks, oyster aquaculture parks that we'll be talking about more. What could be better? It, it's a very complex process. Um, it was a little bit surprising to me, given how complex it is and how many different stops there are for the different permissions that are required to get to actually having an oyster farm, uh, it, that, that it's working so well in Alabama. But there was a lot of complaints about it, that at each step, uh, it was like pushing a noodle, not uphill so much as up a set of stairs. You'd push it up one step and then it gets stuck and then you got to push it up the next step. So if there was a central person responsible for pushing th this through, uh, that would be helpful. There has been, in, uh, specific to Alabama, a marine archaeological survey requirement that seems to have been applied maybe not on an equal footing with similar uh, activities or even more intrusive activities. The idea here being that there might be cultural resources on the bottom. You might stick a piling through it uh, as you put up your, your, your oyster farm. And so you need to survey the entire thing at a cost of seven to ten thousand dollars and six to nine months delay. Um, that, that fortunately is being dealt with uh, through a systematic, uh, more or less baywide, it sounds like, survey that's been done uh, through, through a grant by the state. But there are still areas outside it, and, and I understand that, that the, the existence of this systematic survey hasn't fully filtered through to individual permit applications. Um, so it, it seems reasonable to either eliminate this requirement entirely or at least to reduce it uh, to situations where there's some actual reason to believe there might be a buried ship there uh, or, or to situations where uh, you know, putting in a dock, for instance, would also require this kind of a survey. Uh, one possibility is there's a precondition, uh, there's a health permit that, that's required from Department of Health before you can start operation, which is a little bit different than, than, than most states. And so uh, rather than requiring that step, it might uh, speed the application process if this were just made a requirement to comply with those health regulations rather than uh, a, a pre-operation uh, certificate that I will comply with the, those, those regulations. Uh, you've heard a lot about hatcheries and nurseries, and I won't spend a lot of time about that. Uh, that's, that's crucial, having more seed supply and more stability of seed supply and uh, distribution uh, geographically. Uh, uh, increasing the pre-permitted uh, oyster aquaculture parks could be very helpful, uh, it, it gets you over the hurdle, the initial hurdles, they can just slot in and start operation. Uh, and one other thing, the, Alabama, unlike the, at least Louisiana and, and the other states that I'm familiar with, um, doesn't actually lease you the water bottoms. Uh, they, uh, whoever has the upland, the, the land that's adjacent to the water has riparian rights and you can use the water bottoms up to, in this case, 600 yards in front of it. Well, if, if that land is state-owned rather than privately owned, uh, there's not really a process uh, to, uh, uh, to, well, it would be to lease those riparian rights belonging to the upland owner, the state. And uh, they're in the process of working through that, and that should be able to expand the areas that are uh, available for aquaculture. Florida uh, has an perhaps even more vibrant off-bottom culture. Uh, they've got laws that really support aquaculture uh, right in the, in the text of it, providing a direction. They have as close to one-stop shop permitting as you can get, uh, even with respect to the federal permits. Uh, it, it's one application uh, that, that uh, authorities essentially, I don't think they use the word delegated, but functionally seems to be delegated from the core to the, to the state to administer those. Uh, permit. They, uh, there are pre-designated uh, aquaculture use zones where any permit application just zips through. Uh, you got to comply with some best management practices, uh, uh, and there's sometimes grumbling about inflexibility of those, but it, it, it zips through. Uh, and there's uh, excellent centralized online resources uh, to explain to someone how to get through all this. Uh, creating more of these AUZs, aquaculture use zones, uh, they can be derailed kind of easily with use conflicts and maybe raising the threshold for what constitutes a, a conflict might help. Uh, you have to have 10 applications for actual leases in a particular water body within six months to get a new one and that, that 
stringent threshold might be a little bit reduced. Uh, of course, we will talk about, have talked about increasing the seed supply. And uh, uh, one thing that, that has been emphasized there is creating a public tetrapoid uh, oyster broodstock line uh, as opposed to the proprietary one that, that seems to be uh, pr prevalent everywhere else. Another thing that might be helpful in particular for Florida mitigating storm impacts is to work with growers in the other regions to develop insurance uh, programs that are better suited to oyster aquaculture, which has its own unique needs. And, and apparently uh, there are uh, efforts in the East Coast growers, with the East Coast growers, and, and it might be helpful to, uh, to team up. But like many of these recommendations, it, it could be useful Gulf-wide, uh, but uh, again, this came up a lot in Florida, and Florida has a lot of exposure, obviously, to, to storms. Uh, and another thing that was mentioned frequently is there, there isn't an industry association that, that's specific to oyster aquaculture in Florida, and, and creating one might be helpful. In Louisiana, we have clear authority, if I do say so myself, for off-bottom aquaculture. We call it alternative oyster culture. Uh, the, the agencies are supportive of it, and it's really a simple permitting process, despite what the applicants think. Uh, it, it's, it's about as simple as it could get. You, you have to get a coastal use permit, which you apply for jointly with the core permit permits. Uh, and as long as you've got your drawings, uh, you're going to get it. Now, an oyster, oyster mint is not going to be the same as an oil and gas uh, a company that's going to have a whole department used to doing all this, so it's been somewhat intimidating. Um, we'll, we'll talk later, helping people through this with examples. That's what the Sea Grant has been has been working on. Uh, but uh, if these were made centrally available, that could be helpful. We do have one permitted oyster park. Uh, however, unlike some of the other states, it has to be created sp directly by legislation, and that's how it was done. It's outside, actually, of the uh, oyster aquaculture program. Doing more of these is going to be one of the things we recommend. But another thing we do well, we have really a quasi-public body, the Oyster Task Force, uh, that speaks for the industry to government. And it's now uh, form, what, formed a while ago, the Aquaculture Committee, but it's become active in the last couple months. And again, some of the folks here have been participating in that. Things we could do is to clarify the procedures. Um, so when we, we wrote it six years ago now, it was really a, kind of a simple, simple affair. It needs a lot more flesh on the bones, um, like there is in Alabama, like there is in Florida, uh, perhaps with annotated uh, steps and guides for each, uh, each thing that has to be submitted. The regulations need to be uh, updated to address permitting on private water bottoms. In Louisiana, we have a huge dispute over whether water bottoms, you can float a boat on it, you can fish on it, you can do everything you want on it, but is it private land or not? And that depends on the fight between uh, the, the, the state, which says uh, under the civil code, when uh, land erodes into navigable water, it now becomes state water bottom, versus the private landowner says, yeah, but I got a piece of paper that says I own it, and uh, it's filed in the registry, and I've been paying taxes on it. Um, so to kind of get around having to resolve that fight, uh, one of the things that was done was to allow oyster aquaculture for the first time on private bodies. Uh, when we first wrote the law, it was limited to state water bottoms. Um, so the law allows it, the regs don't. Wildlife and Fisheries is doing what it can to kind of circumvent the lack of regs uh, by, uh, they, they did one, they called it a mariculture permit, um, but uh, it's, it's catch as catch can and it really needs to be formalized. Another problem is oyster aquaculture is limited in Louisiana to where there is a pre-existing oyster lease granted to somebody, and there's 8,000 of them and 400,000 acres of that, uh, but there is a moratorium on, on new ones, and uh, there's, the coast is moving, uh, and so different areas are becoming better for uh, oyster culture over time. And there's, we're hoping to lift that moratorium. Al uh, and I have been working with many others uh, to try and get that, get that raised. But it's gonna be years, uh, even if it happened tomorrow before that happens. In the meantime, to get things going, providing some authority for unleased state water bottoms, this doesn't apply to the private side, just the public ones, uh, to, uh, to be leased for, or to be used for off-bottom oyster aquaculture. We do have a potential in Louisiana for uh, duplicate permitting requirements by the, the local uh, 
parishes. And uh, to date, that's been just really imposed as a $2,000 cost, and yet looking at the same information that the state looked at in the coastal use permit and the Corps looked at. So it, it doesn't seem to add any protection. And to the extent we're talking about state water bottoms, arguably inappropriate for the, the local government agency to be telling the state what it can do with its own property. And so uh, excluding oyster aquaculture from local permitting uh, would be important. We think expanding the pre-permitted parks would be very helpful. Of course, again, developing more hatcheries and nurseries and increasing them, uh, penalties for theft. It's actually, if you steal a certain amount of $5,000 worth of uh, oyster equipment, it, it's uh, less of a penalty than it is if you stole $100 from a, from a, a store. Doesn't seem right. Mississippi, we're just getting started, um, and the, uh, the state's actively supporting it. There's a Governor's Oyster Council behind that. There is a, 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 a training park uh, that's going to enable pre-permitted oyster, uh, oyster farms in the future. They're in the process of streamlining state reviews, uh, including combining those two first uh, steps, the lease and permit approvals. There's a problem with lack of areas that are good for oyster aquaculture, though, and of course, lots of uncertainties all along, all around. So recommendations include identifying areas that are suitable for that. As the regulations are implemented, uh, to provide a, com a comprehensive one-stop shop for information, uh, improve the federal side of the permitting efficiencies. Mississippi has denied concurrence for all nationwide permits, uh, which includes the nationwide permit 48 for oyster aquaculture, and uh, granting concurrence at least for that one uh, could really help with the, uh, the permitting on the federal side, as could uh, getting kind of ahead of things with the uh, programmatic uh, Endangered Species Act consultation, which is something that's been done in Washington to, to, good, to good effect. Uh, we also recommend allowing permit flexibility, not to the extent of changing things so that use conflicts change, but to the extent of allowing different gear to be used, changing the mess size, changing the, you know, the exact size of, of things or configuration that, that don't really make major changes that will impact people. Texas, as we've heard, uh, doesn't have uh, 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 aquaculture yet. And uh, even though it's primed to, to, to be able to do that, and they call it oyster mariculture uh, instead of off-bottom oyster aquaculture, it's just however things are defined in the law. That's that's what we're going to call it. Uh, we call it alternative oyster culture. Uh, oyster mariculture is just the same thing uh, in Texas. So the recommendations, obviously, are to authorize it, to do some regulations for it. Um, there's lots of examples that can be, uh, can be selected from, from the other, the other states, and, and some, some best practices here that uh, we can recommend, including these pre-permitted parks. And uh, one-stop shop for information for applicants is going to be important, um, and of course, ideally, one-stop shop for uh, the permits itself, which is, has now been shown to be possible. Gulf-wide. Uh, thing that's been very helpful is putting into the law something supportive of aquaculture. Uh, if you can get it specifically to oyster aquaculture, great, uh, but uh, just but policy statements kind of guide everybody uh, in the state government as they implement things. Streamline uh, the agency coordination. Having an aquaculture coordinator, whatever you call it, uh, one, one person who pushes the noodle up each of the steps. Uh, federal state alignment. Uh, if you can do one-stop shop for permitting, that's great. Uh, look, in Florida, you have the, uh, the, the, the one permit application that where the state takes care of even the federal aspect. It's a little bit reversed on, in Alabama as to the uh, uh, Corps of Engineers part of it. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's a joint permit with the uh, Department of Environmental Management and the Corps, but the Corps handles for both. So it's one-stop shop, but only for part of the process. And one idea that's really helpful, rather than going through so much individual permitting, identify best management practices. What will satisfy each of the regulators at each of these steps? And just make people say, I'll do that. And so if they want some variation, then you can go through the regular process. But if you, if you know enough and can be specific enough, as they are in Florida, uh, then, then, then just require that and eliminate all this extra review and angst. 
program, if you can't go that far, programmatic permitting, uh, you know, using nationwide permit uh, as they do in Alabama, but don't in, in Mississippi. Um, simplifies greatly the, the review on the, on the federal side, uh, as could a, a programmatic ESA consultation. Uh, and then the safe harbor standards, that's the same idea as best management practices, uh, that uh, if you accept this, you can go ahead. Uh, if you want variety, you're allowed, but you're going to have to go through more analysis. Expand the, the, the parks or uh, agriculture use zones. Uh, make sure there's regulatory flexibility regarding specific gear. Make sure there's uh, centralized information, ideally annotated permit forms. Shellfish initiatives uh, can be very helpful. We've got Gomexi here, which uh, expands this beyond uh, individual states into the region. Assure, ensure that the, uh, whatever industry associations or trade groups there are have people dedicated to uh, oyster aquaculture. Uh, have something like the Oyster Task Force in Louisiana, Aquaculture Review Council in Florida, quasi-governmental bodies. They have official status. Uh, they are the bodies that speak uh, for the state with respect to oysters or oyster aquaculture or aquaculture generally. And back to uh, the importance of expanding uh, seed supply and hatchery and nursery production. And uh, I doubt that I've got time for questions, but happy to, uh, to talk to you all individually or offline. Ask all the questions you want in about an hour. Uh, Dale Diaz is presenting for uh, Jason Ryder, who couldn't be here. So, uh, Dale, have, okay. have it. Thank you, Steve. Uh, as Steve said, my name's Dale Diaz. I'm a shellfish specialist, and I'm working with Mississippi Department of Marine Resources. Um, Jason has a new addition to his family. Uh, he does send his regret regrets, and I'm glad to fill in for him today. Um, before we get into the details of a project, uh, I would like to discuss the current state of the oyster industry and why we believe aquaculture is beneficial for the state of Mississippi. The oyster industry is an integral part of the Mississippi Gulf Coast. It's important to the economy, the culture, the heritage of Mississippi. Um, but the wild reefs in Mississippi are in a state of decline. If you can see on this chart over here to the left, that before Hurricane Katrina in the 2003-2004 time frame, the wild reefs were producing, in some years, in excess of 400,000 sacks. Unfortunately, since the Hurricane Katrina, we've had a whole host of man-made and natural disasters, Hurricane Katrina, the oil spill, several openings of the Bonnie Carey Spillway, N uh, not to count other environmental factors that are stressors on oysters. So oysters have been in a state of decline for some time. This chart only goes through 2013, but I can tell you the last full year that we had wild harvest in Mississippi, which was last year, we only harvested about 10,000 sacks of oysters. So we believe uh, off-bottom oyster aquaculture is one way to help increase oyster production in the state of Mississippi. It's just one piece of the puzzle. It's not going to save the oyster industry or bring our production up to where we want to bring it up to, but it is one piece of the puzzle that can help increase our production. Uh-oh. So in 2015, Governor Bryant put together the, the Governor's Oyster Council on restoration and resiliency. Um, the goal was to produce recommendations to, produce, uh, to improve oyster production. So the Oyster Council analyzed environmental and economic factors on oyster resources while exploring the role of aquaculture and emerging technologies will play in growing the oyster industry. The Oyster Council had many goals, but the main goal was to increase the amount of oysters in Mississippi through stock assessment and promotion of aquaculture-based farming, and that's both on-bottom and off-bottom farming. Mm. 
So one way MDMR is trying to boost production is by training individuals on the basics of starting an off-bottom oyster aquaculture farm. Uh, we're fortunate that we got a Restore Act grant, that's a multi-year grant, to train people in the state of Mississippi uh, to operate a farm. Uh, we're also fortunate we have Dr. Bill Walton who's heading up the training for us, so it's probably the smartest thing we did was get Bill Walton on board to lead this training. So we bring people in, they have about five classes where they work in the classroom and we talk about oyster biology, different equipment, what's going on in other states, regulation, seafood safety, all those type of things. And then after the five classes, the, the farmers, we loan them some gear, we give them some seed, and we put them out in the field and they grow those seed out for eight to 10 months. While they're growing those seed, they have to develop an operational plan a business plan and a storm plan. And they learn a lot what are actually doing this. It's hands-on and they get idea exactly how much work it is. So this uh, illustrations up here show where we're located. So this is a seafood park that we developed off the coast of Biloxi and Ocean Springs. This is Deer Island, which is just south of Biloxi and Ocean Springs. So all together, this is about 85 acres but only about 50 acres is usable for lease. So we have about 10 acres right here that we let the farmers train in and we use it for research. And then we have the 50 acres here that's available for lease. Now the only way you can lease land in this seafood park is you have to complete a training program in Mississippi to actually be eligible to lease land inside that park. Um, in 2018, we had 14 farmers that started the training program. All 14 of those are in the process of uh, acquiring leases inside the park and trying to start a farm. Uh, for 2019, we just started that class. We currently have 24 people enrolled in that class. And we had the first class last Saturday. So uh, we're moving on and this is the way we decided to do it. Site selection was a big deal. Uh, a lot of times I heard other people talk about site selection. The public tends to want to steer you to places where people can't be successful. So we had to watch out for that. But we do think Deer Island is an area where people can be successful. It's in an area that's approved waters. It's fairly close to land. It's got high salinity. Um, it's got good water flow. It's close to marinas. The bottom type is good. The water depths are good. So a lot of, lot of positive things for behind Deer Island. Uh, so our project is the creation of a mobile single set grow out system for the eastern oyster. Uh, despite all the stuff I just mentioned to you, uh, investment and interest so far, there is no commercial facility in Mississippi that is setting single oysters for commercial off-bottom aquaculture. You know, we're just getting started, we're new. Uh, with the increased demand in other states, there is substantial concern that Mississippi farmers may not be able to obtain adequate seed uh, for the facilities, from the facilities in other Gulf states. Um, because of uh, production concerns, we wanted to create a mobile single set production grow out system for the eastern oyster. So the ability to acquire and raise small oyster seed is important because it allows farmers the ability to receive seed sooner and grow them out to a larger size before being deployed on commercial farms. So the objective is to grow the largest and healthiest animals in the least amount of time at the least expense. All right, so the program goals. So the goals for our program is to design, construct, and operate a mobile setting operation capable of retaining seed, show farmers the potential for the operation and run the various experiments with the seed, and want to demonstrate the potential of a mobile, single set, grow out operation to private industry members. And this is some pictures of the gear that we developed. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. So our goal one is to build and design upwellers. Yeah. 
making sure. Uh, orchard farmers generally buy seed from hatcheries to begin the, cult the cultivation process. It is more economical to buy small seed as it is less expensive for the hatcheries to produce and is, and is easier and cheaper to transport. So shellfish farmers use both land-based and in-water nurseries to grow and produce seed to the size suitable for grow out gear. Uh, so upwiller systems are basically constructed of silos that have, these are just, uh -oh, got the wrong button here, got too many buttons. Here we go. These are the silos and they have a small mesh screen attached to the bottom of them and it has a rectangular tank and a trough down the middle of the tank. So the silos are held slightly off the bottom to allow for good water flow. Uh, there are holes large enough for a pipe to be drilled into the side of the silo that connects to the troughs here to allow water to drain out of the silo and into the trough and drain overboard. So uh, the outflow of water goes through the trough leading to a drain. Thus the water enters the tank flows up through the silo and comes through the bottom and exit through the top of the silo, creating an upweller current. Uh, plankton feeds the seed and the silos cons consistently with water flow. So there's some pros and cons to this type of system. And this system has good water flow. It has high food flow and it's high stock and density. It protects and has protection from predators, and it's portable. It can be moved easily. If we have bad water quality, it can move to another location. Uh, four people can grab this thing and set it on a utility trailer. Um, you also can move it quickly if there's a storm. It does have disadvantages, though. Uh, high maintenance. You have to clean these things consistently. When the oysters feed, the pseudo feces from the oysters gets in these silos and you have to clean them at least once a day. Um, they, uh, where we have it located, it, people could tamper with it, so that could be a problem. Loss of power could be detrimental to the seed, and the seed can be easily lost. Uh, when you fill these tanks, when the seed is relatively small, just surface tension, the seed will float up to the top of the tanks, and if you don't break that, break that surface tension, every single time you'll lose seed. Um, I will tell you, if you've never operated one of these systems, it's kind of amazing to watch. Uh, you get the seed originally. It's generally just about the size of a piece of sand. If it's on type of this uh, fine mesh screen and it just barely covers the bottom. And you come back every day and you got to clean it. And just in a matter of days, it's up to the size of oatmeal. And then within a few weeks, we had this seed up to about the size of your fingernails. And that's the point at which we moved it out onto a um, the leases for grow out. So it, it is amazing to see how well they'll grow when they're put in a good environment. So this is the first upweller system. So also um, as part of goal one, we developed this bottle upweller system and it works very much the same way except instead of a rectangular tank, water comes into the system right there where the green hose is at up through the pipes and tubes and it feeds the bottom of these tubes where you put the oyster seed and you can regulate the flow of water with the valves right here. Um, this system has some advantages and disadvantages. It's got high, high water flow, it's got high stock and density, it's protected from predators, it's got a small footprint, it's very easy to move, it's, um, it's got some disadvantages too. The seed can be easily lost just slight variations in the amount of water pressure that you send through here can blow your seed out through the trough and blow them overboard. Um, it's easier to put in a protected area. We was able to put this inside of a storage room to run it. Uh, loss of power is also detrimental. One big advantage to this type of system is just through the water flow, the pseudo feces, you can run the water at a rate where the pseudo feces will work its way through and float on off the top and it cleans itself. So that is a big advantage. 
However, after, after working with both systems, I prefer the silo system. I think uh, it seemed that the oysters grow a little faster, and the fact that you're in there dealing with them every day, it's easier to monitor what's going on with them. All right, so goal number two is to train and run experiments with seed for proof of concept for Mississippi farmers. So what we did for goal number two is last year, we raised about 500,000 seed in both of the upweller systems that I just uh, had on the screens. Uh, of those 500,000 seed, we deployed about 380,000 seed to DMR's training site behind Deer Island. Um, and we use those to help train the aquaculture participants that are in our classes. <laughs> so goal number three is to demonstrate the operation to private industry members. So the project has been extended to August of 2019. DMR will raise additional seed this year, and we're gonna use it to train the 2018-19 off-bottom training participants on build out of the system and operation of the system. And we're gonna host uh, two training seminars with industry members this year. And the last thing I wanted to mention real quick is we raised those 360,000 seed behind Deer Island. We raised them up to about an inch and a half. So they were diploids, and we decided we wanted to use those in, a, in an experiment. We wanted to see if we could use those single oysters for restoration purposes in Mississippi. Uh, there were a couple of papers out that where people had tried to use single oysters for restoration in other states, and it didn't work in other states, and it did not work in Mississippi. We put those 360,000 oysters on three acre plots, and we came back in two months and could not find a single oyster. So. Uh, it doesn't work for restoration, but it was a good use to give it a try. With that, uh, I'd also like to thank Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission, National Marine Fisheries Service for providing the funding for this project. Questions, if anybody has any for, uh, for Dale. Dale, good, good job in, in place of Jason. Please extend our uh, congratulations to him. Um, the, um, the last comment you made, that was single cultureless seed, correct? Yes. Did you, did you all try any spat on shell in Mississippi waters? We have done spat on shell. Now, spat on shell is a completely different story. It seems that the singles are, uh, I think Bill Walton referred to them as potato chips to predators. Yeah. Uh, I believe that's what happens with the singles, the crabs, mm -hmm. and probably different fish carry them off. Uh, but uh, for the remote set facility that we have in Mississippi, we do that on shell, and the shell protects the spat, and we have had some success with that. Okay, good deal. Um, <clears throat> in reference to the, the cleaning, and, you, and the difference between the silo and the bottle, what do you think is the main difference what uh, uh, created a difference between maintaining or cleaning from the feces um, in your upwelling approach? The, the, the silos are harder to deal with because the screen is so fine and it gets clogged every day. If you come mm -hmm. twice a day, you'll, you'll clean it twice a day. Uh, so that is a lot more difficult to deal with, but I like the silos better. You deal with them every day. You got your hands on them. And you, you can see, I mean, the first day you go there, it's just barely covering the bottom. You come back two days later, it's a quarter inch thick. A week later, you got an, an inch and a half of those same oysters have grown up in that tank, an inch and a half. And, you know, it just seemed like you're able to take better care of them. But it is harder to deal with and it's harder to clean. And it, it, I do think while we didn't check this, I think we got better growth rates out of the silos also. Okay. And that's just an observation. We did not have that as part of the experiment. Do you think you can change the, 
on the dynamics of the, your silo to, to be able to mitigate some of those uh, problems that you have with cleaning instead of being a, and take something from what you do with the bottle method? I don't really have any good mechanisms to change the way we handled the silo okay. at this time, but that is one of the things I'm gonna give Beth Walton's group a plug. I've been to Oyster South Symposium two years in a row. And if you're having a problem in this industry, somebody else has had that problem. And oyster farmers tend to be very willing to help each other. And both years I've went to their symposium, I've come away just learning all types of things and new good ideas for the state of Mississippi. And I'm sure people that are dealing with these silos have done things to improve them. So, sure. I do not know it off the top of my head. I can get that and let you know, though. So I'll let you know. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Bill. Right. And yes, in case he's listening, congratulations, Jason. Poor timing. All right, our final speaker is the famous Bill Walton. So come on up, and we'll uh, we'll give you the give you the floor. <laughs> No pressure. Uh, I, I think of myself as the other Bill Walton on your schedule, the uh, older, less pretty one. Um, so thank you all for having, having us here, and, and thank you to Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission for the, for the funding for this. Um, this was an experimental study about uh, summer mortality of triploids. So as has been mentioned, there is very high demand uh, in the Gulf uh, for oyster seed, and specifically triploid seed. So they are considered to have better summer meat quality, and they're also considered to grow faster. Um, I will point out there is, with the proprietary version, there is a, a, like typically a 15% surcharge in what you pay for those seed. To give you an idea, though, that is not just here. In, in Virginia, where they harvested about 40 million oysters in 2017, um, they are planting a, a over 90% triploids. The last year that Auburn provided uh, seed to the industry, because we've now transitioned to letting private hatcheries do that, um, we provided uh, 36 million triploid oysters compared to uh, orders for 6 million diploids. So that's the type of uh, ratio that you're seeing. Growers definitely wanted triploids and, and still do. Um, but there is concern about that, and that's not just here. Um, some colleagues in Virginia, uh, Joey Matt and uh, Stan Allen, uh, they have presented this at a couple meetings at National Shell Fisheries. I don't think they've published this yet, um, but they have talked about uh, concerns there where they get spotty triploid mortality. It doesn't happen every year, it doesn't happen at every site, but they have had sites where you have had very, very high mortalities. Um, and so they have been looking at it. And then for a sister species on the west coast, uh, the Pacific oyster, Gigas, Cheney et al. did find this um, work, uh, in some of their work, that there has been summer mortality. So these spikes up here are triploids, and that's always been associated with um, uh, summer, summer warming. So uh, given that, we did have, um, in 2016, uh, we had farmers coming to the shellfish lab and saying, uh, why are the oysters dying? They're all dying. Um, and I'm talking about mortalities exceeding 50%. We had growers uh, complaining of very high mortalities in 2016. Many of them associated that with the fact that they were triploids. One of the problems with this was most of the oysters that they had were triploids. So it wasn't exactly clear, and sometimes triploids were gotten at a different time of year than diploids. And so we wanted to go out and find out, is there actually, is it, is it the triploid that is, is having the problem, or did we just have a bad summer? So with a, a former student, we went out in 2016 and 2017 and looked at that at these four sites in Alabama. So we have oyster farms in a variety of areas. We have some up in the Mobile Bay area. This gets a lot of fresh water. We have some, uh, uh, Portersville Bay is a site that we use but wasn't a study site here. Grand Bay is up along the Alabama-Mississippi line. We have the backside of Dauphin Island and over here in uh, Navy Cove over in southern Bon Secours Bay. So we went out to those sites and we did put out uh, triploids and diploids right next to each other um, and um, at those four sites. And to my surprise, uh, that year we found that at all four sites, by the end of the year, the cumulative mortality, so in each case it was significantly, statistically significant that the dotted lines, which are the triploids, died at a higher rate than the diploids. I will point out, though, 
but it did not happen at the same time. This wasn't because we got a lot of fresh water in June and all the triploids died. You can see that the mortality happened at very different times. So there's something complicated going on here. But that prompted us to apply to the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission and say, look, uh, we have a problem. Um, farmers are getting triploids. What can a farmer do about it? Um, I will tell you, when we started asking around about this, some guys from Australia said, well, yeah, no kidding. Like, you got to baby those things. They're real fragile. You didn't know that? And so they, their advice was basically be careful how you handle your triploids in the summer because uh, sort of, it was sort of the, the candle that burns twice as bright burns half as long. Like, you know, be careful. Um, that is complicated because oyster farmers routinely impose stress. We are doing things like grading and tumbling to sort by size. That also helps shape and clean the oysters. Um, but there's also desiccation to help control biofouling. And in the Gulf of Mexico, my argument would be that we need to do that. We have great growing waters for oysters, but we also have incredibly heavy biofouling. And so if you can't keep your oysters and your baskets clean, that is a problem. And desiccation seems to be the most cost-effective way that I, that I know of so far to do that. So the question was, um, what happens if you do those things? And is that going to affect your triploids at a higher rate? Come on. Whoops. Oh, I messed up. Uh, oh, all right. So the farmer imposed stress of grading. Um, Joe, are you able to start? Oh, there it is. Um, so grading or tumbling is done periodically to sort oysters by size. And so you run these oysters through, and they fall through the different holes. Um, and it's a great tool for sorting your, sorting your crop. Um, it's probably not, the, probably not the best day that those oysters had that week, though. That is a, a fairly tough process. There is some shell breakage. You do get some chipping. And you can get, um, typically, we don't see mortality if you do it right. But you can get some, it, it is, looks to be a stress. In addition to grading, then we also have this, um, uh, this stress of desiccation, which I'm sure we'll get to. <laughs> Never put a video in a talk. Um, so this is another one is desiccation. Routine desiccation is the idea that we lift these baskets up out of the water. And I, there are a number of ways to do this. But uh, the method that we have um, recommended at Auburn Shellfish Lab is, look, the sort of foolproof method is once a, once a week, you go out and you take your oysters out of the water. They're out of the water for 24 hours. You come back and you drop them back in. We have some variations on that depending on how hot it gets. and we. We tamp back on that in the winter because we don't need to do it that much. But we, you know, that is sort of what we have been recommending. So given that, um, I had a student come in, uh, Sarah Bodenstein, who successfully defended uh, her master's yesterday and was, was part of this. She came out and she really gets the credit for doing the bulk of this work, um, where we set up sites in Alabama at Grand, uh, at Grand Bay, at Deer Island in Mississippi, and then down in Grand Isle. Um, and this we were selected to reflect the variable growing conditions, um, but also areas used by the industry. So the experiment started in April. We took fairly large oysters. These were oysters that were about 60 millimeters. We had seven cages per site. We have six bags per cage. And we put three triploids and three diploid bags in each. And we arranged those in an alternating pattern to try to make it fair. And we kept the densities really low. We only put 75 oysters per bag. So again, we imposed these stress treatments. And we did both tumbling and desiccation uh, to, to get both those effects. And so what that looks like is tumbling. You have tumbled and not tumbled or graded. And then desiccation of 0, 18, 24, or 48 hours, which should lead to eight treatments. But it turns out that you uh, cannot grade oysters and keep zero hours of drying. So we actually lose a treatment. So we end up with seven, uh, seven ways that the oysters were treated, hence the seven cages. So when you look at across all the sites, I just want to show you that um, this is uh, growth. And I just want to show you that uh, this is at zero hours. And then you see 18, 24, and 48. Statistically, these two had significantly lower growth than the uh, ones out zero, with this being intermediate. So uh, across the sites, we saw some of this. We also saw a lot of statistical um, interactions. So what we did is we ended up statistically pulling it apart and analyzing site by site. Uh, just because uh, three- and four-way interactions are not something that uh, you want to have to explain to anyone. So at two sites, triploids outgrew diploids. And just to spend a moment here, uh, 
the blue line is the triploids. So this is, they actually started smaller than our diploids. And as you see, um, the, by the end, they were bigger. And so you're really looking at the rate of change here. And in both cases, even though these ended up at the same size, the triploids started smaller. So at both these sites in Mississippi and Louisiana, the triploids outgrew the diploids, which is sort of what we would expect. In Alabama, it was a little more complicated. Uh, oops, did that not go forward? I thought it did. Uh, in Alabama, grading uh, complicated that. So here's what happened. If you look at the red lines, they grew pretty much at the same rate. It didn't matter if those diploids were tumbled or not. What was interesting with the triploids that were not tumbled got up to this size, whereas the th triploids that were tumbled broke off some shell and didn't grow as much. So uh, it turns out that even at this site, statistically, uh, the growth rate for these triploids that were tumbled was still higher than the diploids. So from a growth advantage, you know, it wasn't a surprise to us that our triploids do tend to grow faster. But again, we wanted to look at um, uh, mortality, and here's what we got. So this is statistics. Statistically, in Louisiana, triploids did die at a higher rate than those, than the diploids. It's not particularly high. That's 5% right there, to give you an idea. So we had statistically higher mortality in the triploids, but that's not the type of mortality that usually freaks a farmer out. Interestingly, and this shows why this is going to be a problem to test and to, to solve, we did not get differences in mortality at the other two sites by ploidy. Uh, the triploids and diploids survived at the same rates at the other sites. Um, but, and this was important, we were imposing enough stress to get a response because in Louisiana, when we tumbled oysters, it turns out that if you tumble oysters, uh, you actually get a slight bump in mortality. And if you dry oysters 48 hours, it turns out that you get a bump in mortality, which just means to me that in the experiment, we were imposing enough stress to get a, a mortality response from those oysters. Importantly, no difference whether you were a triploid or a diploid. The stats say that that didn't matter. In um, uh, Alabama, we got the same typical, the same pattern of response, except mortality was higher for us. So again, there's a tumbling cost. If you tumbled, your oysters died at a higher rate. And if you dried 48 hours, you can see this big jump in mortality. And that, you're talking 60, 70 percent. There was a very high cost uh, in Alabama. But again, no effect of ploidy. In Mississippi, again, ploidy didn't it didn't, wasn't an issue here. Um, and what we see is here you start to see an additive effect. If you had oysters that you dried for 24 hours and didn't tumble, this was their mortality rate. It jumps up when you add in tumbling. Uh, similarly, at 48 hours, you can see that you get slightly higher mortality if you don't tumble. But when you add tumbling, it jumps up. So in both cases, the, there was sort of a, uh, an additive uh, cost there. But Really, um, what we found from that was, to, sort of to our surprise, is that uh, triploids did have that growth advantage um, it, that was affected by grading, but, uh, and desiccation stress of 48 hours reduced growth rates regardless of ploidy. So that doesn't matter if you're going trips or dips, it's, it's going to do the same thing to you. But really, um, from a mortality point of view, um, the, this was, for me, surprising, was that we didn't see um, an effect of ploidy. So those triploids, at only one site did we see that the triploids died at a higher rate this past year, in, in 2018. And in the other ones, there was no interaction with stress. So the two things that we tested that farmers do, turns out that that didn't, that didn't lead to higher mortality. Um, so at each of the three sites, the, the, we know that the stress could kill oysters, but it didn't matter if you were trips or dips. And so you can get into some finer points here about grading and desiccation um, and this additive effect at Mississippi. Um, but what I want to end with on that, which I think is probably my last side, is our recommendations to farmers in terms of triploids is you certainly need to be careful of this because they do seem to be more sensitive under some circumstances. But under the conditions that we tested, the triploids were not more vulnerable uh, to what the farmers were doing. There do seem to be differences caused by the environment, and we would love to get at that. I don't think that's a simple answer. I don't think that's going to be just putting out a salinity gauge and finding out that low salinity kills those oysters. I, I think it's probably multiple stresses. I think it could be low DO. I think it could be salinity and obviously some temperature stress. Um, but we haven't found a simple answer to that yet. Um, but we were relieved to say to farmers that there are some recommendations we would give in how much stress you impose on your oysters in the summer. Um, 
but that uh, typically um, you under these conditions that the trips uh, were not more vulnerable than the dips. And so with that, I can uh, take any questions or we can go right to the question section if you want. So you Okay, so back to the, the Aussies, what would you say, Mike? The, <laughs> the, um, do, are they more fragile or not, Bill? Would I say they were? In, under yeah, the, back to the Aussies, I mean, what do you, uh, were they right or wrong? In our case, they were not more fragile. They were not more fragile, so the not. Aussies are wrong? Uh, they're growing a different species. Okay, um, that's so true. I don't know that they're wrong, but their advice did not apply to us under these conditions. Ah. My caveat is, I think that because triploids may be more stressed by some of the environmental factors going on behind them, that if we had a year that was environmentally stressful to an oyster, that suddenly you might see more of that. But we only had one site this year where we studied it, we only had one site where triploids died at a higher rate. And so um, I think that that's the only site, Grand Isle was the only site where we saw a difference. Okay. I can follow his question. Have you thinking about that uh, for your experiment? Have you thinking about uh, the genetic background sure. for the triploid and the uh, triploid and the diploid? Do you use because of the father must be different? Do you do the experiment? The mother is the same. Yes. And also for the the heavily and uh, mortality in the summer. And uh, do you have you any uh, analysis about uh, their? Uh, what kind of a tetraploid sperm they used, or the, how many diploid did they use, how many tetraploids did they use? That's a lot of questions genetically. Sure, and I can check those. We definitely used, they were half siblings, and so they were, they were from the same, uh, same mothers. Uh, they shared mothers. Um, but certainly, we have to look at the tetraploid broodstock and ask a question about whether the tetraploid broodstock is the issue. And so that's, I know one of the things that Stan Allen has looked at is trying to like test that to look at how much of it is, is a genetic component. Yeah, that's what uh, you were to say. You know, tetraploids, when you build it up, that's a, it's the beginning is not the ending because tetraploid itself is still continuously, right. you wanted to build up a strong breeding, right. um, Per, but not breeding programs or breeding stocks yeah. with, uh, with uh, uh, diversified uh, genetic background. Thank you. Hey, Bill, John Scarpa. Um, so 35 years ago, Shatkin's paper, right, check er, our earliest work, triploids don't do as well in poor environments. Right. So I don't think we're actually seeing anything new. You know, we're worried about all this other stuff. It's triploids. So I think, you know, your, your idea, of, yeah, it's totally environmental, as well as farmers. Right. We all know farmer effect, you know. I'm not going out today, it's raining. So it's 48 hours of desiccation, they don't tell you that. Right. 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 But, you know, triploids, way back when it first started, it's Maine said they have problems in, in poor environments. So, you know, we have to consider that without even thinking about anything else. It's just basic. Yes. Peace, right? Yes. So growth is nice, right. but mortality is going to be what's really important. You right. can't, you can sell a bigger one and make, that's nice, and or grows faster, whatever that is, but if it's dead, you can't sell it. Right. So. You only make money harvesting oysters, not growing oysters. I would agree. <laughs> so the mortality is really the important part. I, I, that's just the thinking I, I'm putting uh, those two I think together. it's both. I mean, you, yeah. you need them to grow faster because that reduces your costs. But, uh, well, you'd like them to grow faster. That reduces your costs. But I agree. You, need, you definitely need survival of the oysters. I will say, I, I know Chris has a question, but um, one of the industry issues in Virginia has been that growers worry about this a lot when there's a year with a high mortality. And then because it's a, it's a flashy problem, it's a problem that comes and goes, when it's not a problem anymore, they stop caring about it. And so it's, this is a very sporadic problem, and so it's hard to get a handle on. So it looked like the 24-hour desiccation and the tumbling mm -hmm. had a big impact on mortality 
at no matter site. what at one site yeah so have is that information y'all provided to the to the growers yeah. that 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 appears yes. to cause a lot more mortality we we did the present assembly. this at, we did we presented at oyster south and we presented it at the recent meeting in aquaculture and we'll put that out into some recommendations to growers so we will try to turn this into something that uh, we can get out to growers in a i don't know if handouts are the way to go anymore or if it's something on their phone but we'll get we certainly will share that information i agree There, there are gentler tumbler methods. Um, there are some that use almost like a water bath, um, and uh, I've seen that. Um, those are maybe a little more expensive. There are ways to do that, absolutely. Uh, arguably, though, some farmers, you, you want it a little rough. Like, they want some of that to break off those edges. So. All right, well, let's, uh, let's quit the questions here and bring everybody up to the front table and just add some more broad questions. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. And we'll, uh, we'll set the table for everybody. Uh, the speaker, the, the way that this works, you push the button. When your button turns red, you have the ability to talk. So feel free to move in where you want. And I'll move around the audience. I may not be super fast, but if you could, wait till you have the microphone so that we're sure to capture the, uh, the question along with the answer, not just the answer. We got enough space? Oh, okay. All right. So I'm going to give the prerogative to our executive director for the first question. Steve. <laughs> Bill, you talked about uh, the mortality for diploids and triploids, and, and it, it may be there may be environmental factors involved. Did, did you guys collect baseline environmental data for this study as well as the previous one so you could look at that or? That is a great question. We found um, we did not have, I don't have the money in the lab for continuous data loggers. Um, and so we don't have that complete continuous record. We have spot samples. And so we do have that environmental data. And, and uh, Sarah, she goes by Squid, my student, has that in her thesis. Um, but. Um, we'll probably be using proxies for some of the monitor, some of the gauges that are around closest that we can get. So Chad Hansen with the Pew Charitable Trust. Thank you all for the presentation today. I'm sorry I missed a couple of them. I had to step out for another conference call. But um, so I may have missed some of it. But I guess my question is sort of generalized, but it's similar to what I asked uh, um, Mr. Wynn earlier. But we're in, interested in like the ecosystem effects, ecological effects of uh, aquaculture, positive or negative, and quantifying that. And I'm just wondering, what's the state of research in the Gulf through your projects or elsewhere? On and and are there projects coming online that will be answer, addressing some of those questions, oh, uh, nutrient loading and, and reduction, um, you know, habitat, all the different benefits that we say qualitatively that are ecosystem benefits. And I just want to know how much quantification of that is going on at these different sites in the Gulf. Thank you. I guess I'll answer that question. So um, when you can quantify it, uh, and then all of a sudden when you're talking about legislative impact, um, it starts to get people's attention. Uh, red Tide was a huge impact on the economy in the state of Florida last year, which is why we really want to focus on that. Uh, we've had, and I forget who had the dynamic up of uh, the way to improve the aquaculture environment in Florida, the lack of leases. Um, and that is because of the water quality. Some of that is water quality, some of that is um, some other mitigating factors, but we, we want to be able to address that. Um, so in Florida, I can talk about what we're doing. That's why we try to incorporate the entire um, realm of research, um, not only in training the student, but we also want to look at scientifically what are the advantages of improving the ecosystem um, to have more oyster estuaries. Uh, if you have more diploid seed going out, naturally you should be able to see the restoration of these oyster reefs that we used to have in Florida thousands of years ago, which kept red tide at bay. Um, and deploying these oyster domes that we, uh, we talk about, we're not deploying them where red tide is exactly, but when you introduce them into these more conducive areas, what you do is you start to create a habitat um, where you start to see the natural restoration of oyster reefs that have gone away uh, so dramatically, especially in Florida, I think it's what, 85% or 
I'm sorry, 95% of the oyster reef population is going away. So when you start to reintroduce that, and that is a huge impact to us on the industry. Um, has a huge impact when you talk about oyster aquaculture. I think uh, Louisiana had a dynamic up, or Mississippi had a dynamic up from Katrina. How it has dramatically affected the industry? How's it going negatively down? We can say the same thing for Florida. Apalachicola Bay used to produce about 100 million oysters a year. I think about a million is what they got out last year, if that. So uh, to restore that is what uh, I think what a lot of our answers should be. I can't speak to the volume of what's going on, but that's what it should be. I would just add, you know, I think um, I, because there's been so much research on that in other parts of the world and other parts of the country, I found that that's not a particularly fundable question that what we found is is that people say, well, there's good estimates of this from other parts of the country. Why, why would you spend national uh, research dollars doing that question again? And that, that's just, uh, I, I hate that that's, you know, that that's what drives research, but um, I don't have students, to, I, don't, I can't pay for the boats to go out and look at those questions. We've done some theses with, we clearly have shown that blue crab juveniles love oyster baskets. Like, it's a very good habitat for blue crabs. We see lots of them there. And qualitatively, any of us that have been out on a farm know that it's, you see all sorts of critters around them. But uh, it has not been something like a peer-reviewed, like we don't have a ton of peer-reviewed research on that, I don't think. Um, typically, we've taken numbers from the literature and said, well, if an oyster eats this much, we can make some reasonable assumptions, therefore it's this. Well, follow up, Bill. So, you know, there is literature out there on, on, and usually it's more on the oyster reefs than on the on the systems. Although there are that a few that do have the systems, as Bill just said. Because unfortunately, you know, when the good material's out there already, it's kind of like, why are you going to do that again? Now, in Texas, we have a unique system because of the genetics, and so our agencies are real concerned about that movement across the major decline, but. They're taking ultra conservative and saying, look, even within each base system, we're, we're going to start off very slowly. Uh, and even that one where I know when I put in proposals to look at that basic effect of, okay, if I have an oyster system out there, what is the infiltration of the genetics onto the local population? You get varying responses. And if you don't get it across the board excellent, you're, you're toast. You know? um, so some, you know, some people really want us to do it, others don't. The state's not coming up yet, but as we come closer to aquaculture, mariculture, it probably will be funded in some sort. Um, we have a little bit there. So it, it's an interesting part. And that restoration, we do, we use a lot of restoration science on this. And even there, you look at restoration science for genetics, and sometimes, like, we don't see the signal. Um, you know, Putting substrate out almost seems to be more, unless you're truly larval limited, you know, then, then, then they have a place to settle. So yeah, it's a tough one. I know it's, a lot of it is the, the touchy-feely, as you see, you know, it seems touchy-feely, but there is earlier data that supports it. Um, and I think, you know, Bill hit it on the head. They usually don't go back. Yeah, thanks for all that. Just a quick follow-up. Just in one of the plans and papers I've read recently, um, uh, place in Maryland, I forget the exact bay, but they use it used the nutrient re removal as part of their mitigation plan for a t uh, total daily uh, maximum loading for nutri nitrogen. Um, you know that's per per that bay in that system. I guess where I'm going is perhaps if that's a viable way to mitigate nutrient loading, could that I would I would imagine that you need to have specific bay system application to that across the across the regions and stuff, and perhaps. Aquaculture could be a way to remove some of that nitrogen for that for those uh, loading. I'm just wondering if that's you know a, a viable option or, or a potential area of research in the in the in the Gulf. Uh, I, I, we think so. That's uh, where our focus is actually heading towards when we talk about water quality research. Um, we're part of a family in order to do that. Uh, we can't speak, uh, but we do think that we you can revisit that part of it, uh, and that's what we like to go to in the future. So I'm going to follow up. Of course, nutrient loading, um, and a lot of people say this, it really starts at point source. So it's good, controlling that instead of using something to control it. Uh, and I hear that quite a bit. In Texas, we're having an interesting part because in the, our previous <laughs> year, the comments when I talked to uh, Texas Commission of Environmental Quality, right, which regulates our water quality standards, they actually looked at us and said, well, how much ammonia comes out of your oysters in the cages? What's nitrogen output? And we're sitting there going, well, what's the input of nitrogen first? You know, and, and, and the question coming from the regulatory aspect kind of threw us, you're going you're gonna to regulate us as if we're feeding them 
versus not feeding them. And yes, we change the nitrogen form, but we know we take out some because it goes to somatic, you know, we know it goes to somatic growth. So it's gonna be an interesting time going forward for us regarding some of these water quality parameters. But the bigger question really is, it, most of us is, you, can't, you, gotta, you gotta do it at the point source, not use something else to take care of it. Uh, I've heard that quite a bit for the restoration. We still need the restoration science, we still need these things to get our ecosystems back for the general. But what's coming downstream, whatever, 95% of our water is already wastewater treatment, you know, if it's not there. <clears throat> So what comes into our, our coastal waters, it's everything upstream of us. So you have to have uh, both of those, we feel both of those effects, you have to definitely affect what they're dumping into the water, just like you said, you gotta regulate that more so uh, than looking at, um, and that will maybe help alleviate what we, what we look at do is maybe help some of this process because they kind of completely get people to stop dumping toxins into the watershed that is a tall order um, to try to uh, regulate every company that's doing that as but that's where the effort really needs to start well I, I wanted to add to that a little bit I, I guess in in my mind the it's a it's a process of making some assumptions that you have to make. I mean, number one, is the animal or, or is the animal not, as a number of people have said, a keystone or a critical uh, species in the environment? If it is, regardless of what it's doing, is it removing net nitrogen or not? And I would make the argument that if you're harvesting them, it, they are. If you're not harvesting them, I don't know. So I would, you know, that's an argument actually in favor of taking them out and replacing them either through additional restoration or hatchery seed. But, so if you make the assumption that it's providing some ecosystem services, then if you're putting animals into the system through aquaculture or restoration that's, that's being somehow grown uh, as opposed to say restoration that's putting out culch material but is not actually catching any spat and producing any oysters, then that's a positive thing. And I think one of the frustrating things for the, for the industry that I'm in and I've represented uh, for a number of years is that that contribution of whether it's aquaculture on bottom or off bottom or whatever, that by growing oysters in areas that wouldn't otherwise have oysters, to say that that's not contributing to ecosystem services or, and that that's not in, in some way or shape restoration flies in the face of just simple facts. If you're willing to make the assumptions that I just said, I mean, is the animal important or not? If it's important and you're putting animals, more animals in the water that you'd have than under an un, un, undisturbed situation, then you've got to say that's a positive contribution. And is it, is it pure restoration? Probably not. But I would argue that restoration that doesn't produce oysters but just puts uh, culch material in the water is not really restoration either. So that's, a, that's my political uh, 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 statement for the day. Um, and, and I really wanted the rest of the, the panel to kind of comment on that, that approach to to aquaculture and particularly using hatchery animals and this whole issue of do some of them need to be diploid or triploid. I just kind of think it's, we're studying the, you know, the fuzz coming out of our navel on those things. I mean, is this or is this not a good animal to have in the water, whether it's a triploid or a diploid or not? And it's only important to me, and I'll get off a soapbox here, I promise. It's only important if it's a diploid if your system is spat limited in the particular area that you're in because you don't know where those larvae are transporting to. Uh, they may be transporting to a different bay even. So anyway, i just throwing that out there, thanks. So I'll take first crack at it because we, <laughs> and, the reason, and the reason being because we're preaching to the choir here and, uh, and it, brings up, it, it brings up one of, one of the comments that was written to me which I truly appreciated was he's biased. I want somebody who's biased the other way that doesn't want aquaculture speaking. And I was like, wow, you know, 
I love that they said it. Yes, you know, I don't think there's anyone up here that would say, no, you know, we disagree with you, and it is. We're preaching to the choir on it. And it, it, to me, a lot of times it is the education. For us in Texas, um, you know, obviously we're not, as a state employee, I can't lobby all this, and we're educational resources. And I saw it more in these past two years as I went out to talk to different groups, you know, that it is, what do we do, what can it do? And part of it always was bringing up gear is structure and provides habitat and the oysters provide the living part of that system and provides different aspect of an ecosystem. So altogether, it's really good. And interesting, you know, here it is, we're all hurricane people, you know, saying, and yes, the periodic removal is also good. It changes what's going on in the system. Uh, so yeah, uh, it, it's, it's hard for us to, to go against it. Like I said, I love the person who said I, I was biased. I tell people that up front, actually, at my talks. I'm obviously a culturist. I'm going to tell you the good parts. I tried to show them the worst parts to try to get something out of them. One person finally told me, you're biased. <laughs> and I want somebody who really doesn't want aquaculture. And there are a few comments who people really do. It's like, I don't believe in aquaculture, period. <clears throat> oh, Chris, uh, I just, just to respond to Chris, is like, I, I do think, um, I want to be clear that off-bottom moisture aquaculture, in my view, is only something we can add to what we do. And that we should be doing traditional restoration and we definitely should be working on our natural resources on our bottom culture, whether that's a public reef or a private lease. That we need more oysters, one, for the economy, two, for the culture, our, our communities, and then three, uh, for the environment. Uh, and not necessarily in that order, everyone can prioritize those differently. but. Chris, we've talked about it, like in, in Alabama, Alabama is better off with more oysters in the water than less. We, like, I think we would agree on that. And I think you called it my oyster kumbaya. Uh, like, I, I do think, I, I think that off-bottom oyster aquaculture is not competition with the stuff coming off the bottom leases. And I think that all these things can happen in the same place and that we can produce those oysters and we can have those benefits. And I, again, I, I think we are better off if we have a sum total of more oysters. And off-bottom oyster aquaculture goes in some areas that I wouldn't put a lease, that I wouldn't put a reef. Um, and restoration might go in some places I would never put an area, I would never invest money for a fisheries reef because it's just not that productive, but it might be a good long-term investment for restoration. So I'd like to see us spread those investments out. I want to say ditto. No, I, no, I, I agree with everything he, um, these two gentlemen have said. Um, obviously, they're the experts, um, but it is a keystone species, and so when you remove a keystone species, it has a dramatic effect on your on your ecosystem. So, and that has been argued, has been studied. Um, oysters uh, provide. Uh, enough uh, supply for 300 species, I think is what it is when you read NOAA. Um, so that alone increases the fishery, increases everything around this. When you talk about the crabs, we've seen that on our site just by pure observation. So it increases the fishery too as well. So it's better to have oysters than not to. I'm gonna go back real fast to nitrogen just because it is an important part. And, I, and, and we're talking Long Island Sound, right? Connecticut areas up there. The amount of nitrogen coming off the land is just phenomenal. And so Charles Yarish, you know, seaweed culture, go, to, go even one less level down from us, plant culture. And if you sit there and look at the amount of nitrogen coming off and go how much plant seaweed culture area we would need, it's just astronomical. And it comes back to the point of point source beforehand. But so the other way of mitigating, you know, here it is we're talking about one trophic level up of, oh, we'll take out the phytoplankton. It's getting back to plant-based, which really, you know, as you said, pull it out. Hey, we're, we're using that. Um, but, you know, Dr. Yarish and his stuff there with the integrated multitrophic or just seaweed culture that they're doing up in that area, it's going to take a lot. And so, again, we really need to go back to the points and say, how do we care, take care of it not coming in first? Um, yeah, so talking about nitrogen and ecosystem services. Um, so I've been studying, um, so the thing is that there's a farm model that's going out. It's uh, NOAA's been working on it trying to calibrate the model, and it's been successfully done trying to quantify how much nitrogen is sequestered uh, by the aquaculture, oyster aquaculture, in the Chesapeake and the Northeast, yet it hasn't really been done in the Gulf of Mexico. So I've been, I've been doing that for my dissertation for the, fast, for the past three and a half years. 
So um, trying to quantify it because our growth rates are much faster than the Northeast. So, um, so we're going to have that data pretty soon, hopefully defend this summer. And yeah, so we're working on it um, to try to see how much, to try to quantify exactly how much nitrogen is sequestered by um, the oyster farms per acre. Can you give some preliminary <laughs> I want to say it, but uh, it's up to him. Let's just, let's just say it's good. Okay. It's good. <laughs> I'll comment, don't do it per acre, do it per oyster. Because <clears throat> per, per acre doesn't mean anything to a lot of people. We're, we're doing um, per oyster and then the areas per acre or hectare or whatever. Yeah. Thank you. I don't, I don't really have a question. It's more of a couple of comments. Uh, Mr. Marino's uh, presentation about in, in Alabama. We have implemented a system in Alabama where you can uh, lease those water bottoms, both from our Forever Wild program and from the state of Alabama, uh, to be able to, uh, to do the off-bottom aquaculture. We have a procedure in place for that now. And then um, I do want to point out that the requirement for the marine archaeological information that's not a state requirement that's a Corps of Engineer mobile office requirement and that we have uh, worked with uh, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation through our Mobile Alabama uh, Mobile Bay uh, NEP to do those archaeological surveys really all along our coastline in areas that would be uh, prime for any off-bottom aquaculture so we've taken care of that element of the permitting process uh, that those are just been completed uh, that, that's really all just a comment just to, to catch up where we are now and that's, that's very good to hear also that uh, that marine archaeological uh, requirement was imposed by the Corps but it was through the cultural people at the request of like the, I think it's the Alabama Historical Association or it was a state agency uh, that, 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 that prompted it um, but I'm also glad to hear about the, uh, the leasing uh, I understood that there were still studies underway uh, to determine uh, the, the, the prices that were going to be charged for that um, so it's, it's helpful that they've gotten to the point of uh, uh, actually being able to lease those areas. Are there any uh, tools or data sets for water quality that help you decide where you might uh, site farm? So, I mean, I was think looking at GQs and some of the other remote sensing data. Is there some of that that we could utilize to help us with some of our shellfish decisions and where to put them? Well, so, so you know, the first thing even before that is always going to be uh, Department of Health. And so it, it first comes back to that bacteriological. Then after that, any data, you know, that gives us phytoplankton, temperature, salinities, historically it will help in spatial planning. Um, and it, it really comes down to a lot of that, that sociological factor. Then after that, user conflict. Um, I know when you know TPWD did their original oyster plan and, and how they were going to go about doing that, which was different from what we're discussing, um, the GIS maps to overlay everything, including all the energy pipelines that are underneath every bay, you know, every oil, gas pipeline, everything that was there is kind of in place, but the next part really is the, that for us, once it gets moving, is that spatial planning <clears throat> regarding environmental uh, details beyond the approved, unapproved waters. I think maybe Larry could, could speak to this, but um, I think it's nice to think about where my oysters would grow best and survive best, but I think functionally you have to choose an area that you are, can get a permit for first. And that, like there's a siting tool, Chris uh, in Alabama, uh, uh, Chris Blankenship actually, um, when he was with uh, MRD, helped lead up a website that helped us with the permitting process and that includes a siting tool. And I'll tell you that the biology is a very small part of that siting tool. And that's what it should be. Like, you need to know, are you in an area that allows harvest? Are you in an area, like, there, uh, is it an area where you could get riparian rights? Is it, the, all the uh, functional, like, more, more of the stuff that Larry was talking about is what comes before the water quality. And I know that sounds crazy, but you have to start with a site that you could even get before you start worrying about how well it'll grow oysters. And then you, you pick a subset from there that'll grow oysters best. And that's right. The more that can be done in advance by the state to identify these areas that are acceptable politically, regulatorily, you know, 
the non-science aspects of it um, that, that can be very helpful. And some of the states have already done that, for instance, with, with Florida. And then Deer Park, functionally, is, is, is it's pre-permitted, but it's the same idea. Yeah, I think we spent about a year or two identifying sites um, uh, where we could possibly have it. Uh, and then you get down into, again, with, like Dr. Wallace, then you get down into the biology. But we had to identify first sites and it was all, all kind of factors that would hinder that process of in Florida areas, I can say that. Thank you. I, I have a question for Beth. Um, I enjoyed the, the, uh, the presentation and, of course, the way my cynical mind works. I got my PhD um, in North Kagalaki and um, spent four years of the wasteland of seafood, I guess, from my perspective. But the reason why I was going to, what I'm asking, that North Carolina is not a Gulf state. Um, it, it's an East Coast state. I think it's more, it's more important than North South is the coastal part about getting your oysters you know, where you want them from. So my question to you, as the Atlantic State's Marine Fisheries Commission provided funding for you like the Gulf State has? That's a very good question. They have not yet. Uh, yeah. we, have, we, have, we, have, oh, yeah. yet. we have not applied. And the Oyster South is not Oyster Gulf South. It's the southeast around. So that's a, I hear you. No, no, that's a... That, thanks, John. No, that's a great idea. We'll, we'll definitely be applying in the future for sure. But th thanks for the pep talk. <laughs> I've just got a, a, a couple points to the, to the last question about siting. Actually, NOAA Fisheries through NOS has developed the Gulf Aquamapper uh, tool that, that has, it's, it's unbelievable all the information they have. And it does help, it, it, looks, it looks at the biology, but it looks at, looks at military pipelines, shipping everything so that 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 is now available um and and uh in in our sister agency's defense asmfc they just received funding they haven't had funding for the last several years like we have they just received funding last year but i would re i would uh, encourage you to to apply to them as well great thank you we will <laughs> any others chris oh, hang on I forgot my Fitbit. Uh, uh, this, none of you are, are economists, I don't think, but one of the questions, since you're talking off-bottom oyster production, one of the problems that is looming on the horizon, excuse me, challenges, challenges looming on the horizon is um, if everyone is, is as successful as I hope you all are, will be uh, in growing a number of oysters. The gentleman from Wakulla County said 50 million oysters is, fi oh, 500, excuse me, 500 million. So if we're, if we're growing um, even half that many in Florida and a uh, couple hundred million in Alabama, I mean, it's going to be a lot of oysters. And given the fact that the wild harvest is at historical lows, um, which I think it's unwise to bet that it's going to stay at an historically low level forever, although it may be, it may never get back to where it was. Um, I, I'm, it's really more of a comment, but I'm also interested in your response. You know, what do you think we, our best next steps are to try to not have what happened in Cedar Key, for instance, when the industry kind of boomed and busted on clam aquaculture? Uh, I'd hate to see that happen, and I've expressed this sentiment before. I'm more in the business of selling them, so I want to help these guys sell them, but I do know that there are some limits to what the market will accept, particularly if it all happens very quickly. Uh, so I, ho I hope that you understand my question. Is if, we're, if we're successful or we're able to, we're able to, uh, ex ex to handle the success, Okay, I'll take first crack at it, Chris. <clears throat> um, and it's come down to all, all my not economists. <clears throat> it comes down to my marketers who've just said, hey, if you don't have a market, why are you doing it? It's kind of like, you know, you don't sell. So it's market demand. Salmon industry has done great. It's, you keep demand up. And that's been difficult. I, the Cedar Key one was particularly where asking for a self-tax to allow, you know, people sometimes, nope, we don't want to do that. 
So it all comes down to, to demand. To, you know, and this is coming from the marketing people who look at the biologist. It's like, if you don't have a place to sell it. So yeah, we, I, I keep thinking about it too. Always going, okay, we, we can increase production. You gotta increase demand. So remember, an oyster on your bagel in the morning. Forget that salmon. <laughs> I'm just going to comment real quick on my non-economist background. Um, you know, the bottom has not fallen out. I look at Island Creek. I look at all the farms in the Northeast and the Pacific Northwest. And I think of it as like wines. And, you know, we've talked about this before, Chris. I mean, microbrews, wines, it adds value to everything across the board. And I think people enjoy that. And it does come down to what John's saying, you know, we're all saying get the story out there. It's not just the product, it's the people behind the product. And that's what resonates. And that's what we're so passionate about with what we do with Oyster South. I mean, it involves everybody. It's not just one business. It's a unifying theme, which is the oyster. And it tells the story of the people and everybody's stories that go into it. So I think it's, yes, of course, selling your particular product, but then being focused on how it adds value to everybody else, because that ultimately helps the individual. When you lift everybody up, it helps everybody else who contributes. Thanks. Chris, I just did want to mention to you that in the training program that we have in Mississippi, we do talk to the participants in the program, and we do talk about what you're uh, your, your concern is right now so they're aware of it they need to factor it in when they decide if they want to grow up start a business or not and it's one of the risks that farmers have to keep in their mind and it's something that they need to know in the future could potentially happen so. not only yeah not only look at it locally we have to look at it globally uh, and so in that you can have a huge impact uh, and you say the next step. Um, we're looking at a pasteurization process right now that has a live oyster um, after pasteurization. So uh, now all of a sudden you change who's eating it because some people are not able to eat it. And then that increases your customer base. So that's another step. Um, and I like what Dr. Walden just said uh, about it's the people too involved that it's all involved with all the other businesses that come from it. Um, having a boutique oyster is what we kind of uh, promote in Wakulla County. And then having all the oyster breweries, the, oh, well, the, the breweries, the, yeah, I know, people said beer. So, um, you know, you kind of get everybody involved. When you look at the coast of France, and I think they have a town there uh, that has really been able to market the oyster in that town. That's what we kind of want in our area, in the Gulf, is what we want to be able to do. Um, so that kind of. So uh, I think this is an important question to think about. Um, do we want, is off-bottom oyster farming in the Gulf going to be an industry that is a lot of small mom and pop farms that are growing boutique oysters? Um, or are we going to have some farms that get big and produce large, large numbers of oysters? And I think those are going to, they would be different models. Um, you know, if, if farmers in Wakulla County alone are producing 500 million oysters, I mean, we're not growing 500 million oysters in the U.S. I think on the East Coast and the West Coast right now, I'd, I'd be impressed if it added up to that. So that kind of number would change the business. And um, I, don't, I wish I could say, like, well, we'll just open up more distribution channels and, and more raw bars will open, but that's an incredibly large number. Um, and so I think we do need to think about what we're trying to achieve. And there may be different business models. And, you know, I'm most comfortable with the, the, the model we saw in New England and some of the West Coast farms is producing this boutique oyster. And you have a brand and you're protected against next year. I hope Louisiana has the best damn year it's ever had in terms of producing oysters. And they'll still buy those boutique oysters because they, were, they weren't buying those boutique oysters because they were low cost. They were buying it because they had a name and they wanted it. So they'll still buy them. If you're a farm that's producing 5 million oysters a year, 10 million oysters a year, and your model is to drive down, your, you're driving down the price so that it's a lower cost option, nature can produce a lower cost oyster than you. I'm sure of it, right? Not you, Chris, but anyone, you know? And, and uh, so I think you have to think about that. Um, I hope that our fisheries and our bottom leases aren't done. So um, I'm hesitant to recommend somebody go start a farm to produce an oyster that they can harvest and sell for 25 cents. Um, because I don't know that that's a safe 
business model if we have a great year coming out of Texas or Louisiana. Um, but I think we have to think about it. I, I, I've been impressed since moving to the Gulf and making it home with Beth that the ambition here to grow a business big and take it past just being a mom and pop farm is amazing. And people start businesses and, and make jobs. I mean, that's awesome. Um, and so we have to think about how we accomplish that. And I don't know if that's with um, how we free up the capital for somebody to make an investment like that. But we have to think about those models. And that model may not be an off-bottom oyster farm. That may be some spat-on-shell uh, farm that works on the bottom, on bottom leases. No, I don't know. But you're, you're asking a great question. We have to think about it. Because uh, we're not the only area of the country that's trying to produce more oysters. So. I'll just finish up with <clears throat> Chris's comment about Cedar Key. And this is exactly what was different, right? was that we had more farmers coming in, we, we trained, they came in, and they were selling product as commodity. They weren't selling a differentiated product. The good part is, even though the prices came down, they were still making money. They still are making money. A lot of them got out early and was like, yeah, you're not making X, you're, but you're still making money. Nobody was losing money. Um, and it also stabilized prices, which for any buyer really wants. They don't want that boom and bust, right? That's all part of culture's idea of stabilizing production, stabilizing price. So yeah, in one way it's a bad story, but in another way Cedar Key still is a major success. And it is because it's still going on. It's still producing well. It just doesn't have that differentiated, pro as well a differentiated product. So I'm gonna go again. So I just learned that as goes the craft brew market, so goes the oyster half shell market um, in that last topic. So my question is kind of different. It's the, the back end of it, the, the shelling and the recycling of the, the shells coming off the oyster farms. And obviously there's complications and logistic issues there. But so wh what does that closing that loop look like? And how is that you know, going to be accomplished or can it be accomplished to bring that, some of that shell that's being dispersed locally everywhere, bringing it back to use that as, as restoration for wild reefs? And so that would be, uh, you know, I guess it's pretty broad, but I think that's uh, you know, another area would kind of close that loop for ecosystem services provided by the offshore um, uh, aquaculture. I think that's a worthy goal, Chad. Um, and in Mississippi, we are supporting a shellfish, re a shell recycling program in Mississippi. But if you look around at programs that started in the past, generally they do just fine where they're being supported by some sort of dollars. But whenever you try to transition where they just work um, off of an incentive of a profit, it, it falls apart. So it's such a heavy item. It's the logistically move it and all. It's really difficult for it to sustain itself without some type of support. Uh, we are trying it again in Mississippi to see if we can get it to that point. But it, it, if you look around where it's been tried, it's just hard to do without some extra dollars. Yeah. So, uh, Chad, I think one thing that's so when we farm off bottom oysters, we're targeting that niche market. It's going to the half shell market. So most of those oysters are shipped in the shell somewhere. So that shell is being exported, and we're losing that shell. And so trying to reclaim it is great. Um, I would point out, because off bottom is almost everybody's using hatchery reared stuff, that that is essentially that was not shell that was taken off of a reef. That is shell that was formed out in the water. But essentially, off bottom oyster farming has produced an additional resource that if we can recycle it. That's not, I, I'm not even sure if that's recycling. That's claiming a, a product that did not come from a reef and putting it back and turning it into a reef. And I, I think that's a, a great value added to that. Um, it's complicated. I, I've worked in places, the shell recycling is hard because people throw their cocktail napkins. And I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there. That is a complicated thing to do. But I, I've uh, shucked a few oysters at uh, raw bars, and everybody wants to recycle. Everybody feels good about recycling. So it's, it's something that people want to do, and we should take advantage of that. So I'll just follow up real quick on that. And as Bill pointed out, of course, it is it's that end use. So restaurants, where, where it is a big part is, it's the separation. Um, and what Dale brought up was then it's the financial support. So you know we already have a sink, what's known as Sink Your Shucks program. Galveston Bay has a recycling program through, through the restaurants. But that's all supported through grants. So if you're going to do that, it's almost like our recycling of any waste now that, hey, either you're paying for it, everybody's paying for it, as, you know, and it becomes a public, or in some way it is it's that support to be able to get it back. And as Bill, we've you know, talked about it as we were going forward in Texas, well, hey, we've got Shell, 
the fishery right now has to, the natural fishery has to replace a certain portion already. They have to come in, they either pay or they're actually replacing. But as Bill pointed out, this is new shell, which is really exciting in a lot of ways, but how do you bring it back? Because typically it's a specialty market and the end use is a restaurant. Even locally or far away, it still is. How do you get all these small points back to one point and it comes down to what Dale just said, it comes down to, well, where's the money to do that? How, how's that there? And with that, I think we're going to have. Have I seen you? Yes. So nobody asking me questions. I wanted to. <laughs> hey, you were supposed because to pipe in when we were talking is more Florida. like a laboratory, scientific uh, oriented, but tetraploid is very important. No tetraploid, no seed. No industry, right? All of the stuff talking about uh, downstream, that's the beginning. I want you all and uh, know, recognize the importance of my work. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all right, I'd like to thank you all.